the San Carlos City Council meeting for Monday, January 25th. Uh, please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, item three, changes to the order of the agenda. I understand um, we have one item which we are not going to be taking tonight. Is that correct? That's correct. That's item uh, 5C, the presentation by Sam Trans regarding the transit center. Okay. And um, is that going to be at an upcoming meeting? Yeah, we'll try to get that on the next agenda or the one after that, depending on the availability of Sam Trans staff so the council can get an update on that project. It's not the transit village, but rather the transit station there. Great. Are there any other changes to the order of the agenda? Hearing none, we'll move on to item four, council communications and announcements. And we will start with Mark. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just had one thing I wanted to uh, <clears throat> talk about tonight, uh, which I imagine a number of folks have probably read as I did in the newspaper over the weekend. And it's, it's kind of a teachable moment uh, about public policy setting that unfortunately involves uh, our neighbors to the immediate south. Um, and this concerns the settlement or the proposed settlement that people may have read about of about four and a half million dollars that Redwood City may be entering into as a result of a lawsuit that was filed uh, about the Docktown situation. Um, and that's an unfortunate thing, and I certainly feel sorry for both the citizens of Redwood City who are going to have to bear that burden and, and also the council. Uh, but the point I wanted to make is, um, as best I can tell, it's an example of how um, an elected body uh, trying to do the right thing for each and every one of its residents, that's what they were trying to do, that's why they didn't try to change Docktown, um, ended up running into a problem because the law actually requires certain things to be done. And the point I wanted to make for the benefit of the folks in San Carlos is that not always, but on occasion, if you see an elected body, like perhaps this one that I sit on, uh, doing something that you don't like, uh, it may be something that we're doing that we don't necessarily like either. Um, but it's something that we have to do in order to look out for the interests of the whole community um, and avoid large payouts. So I just wanted to share that with the community. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mark. Ron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, not a lot going on, although this week is a big week. Uh, I've got a lot of things going on, so I'll have a lot of, a lot of comments to, for the next meeting. Um, everything seems to be happening after today. The one thing I did do was I went to a community meeting that was held in the library last week um, to talk about what to do with uh, North Crestview Park. There are a lot of ideas as to uh, how that land might be improved. There's a lot, of, a lot of residents came to that meeting and expressed uh, their ideas and concerns and that sort Sort of thing, and what impressed me was that uh, for the most part, a lot of people are happy with the park just the way it is. So it's going to be interesting. Uh, there may be some minor improvements to that park, but that's a process that's so going to be ongoing. And, and it was nice to go to a meeting uh, where the public was very engaged, and I, and I know the staff's listening to their ideas and and uh, and their comments. And so we'll we'll see where it goes. And uh, actually, since everything's in front of me, <laughs> there's nothing else to talk about right now. All right, uh, good luck this week, Ron. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Bob. Um, similar to, to uh, Mr. Collins, I've, I've got meetings scheduled this week, two or three meetings, but uh, um, hasn't, not a whole lot happened in the last two weeks, so. All right, uh, thanks, Bob. Um, you'll note the um, absence of one of our colleagues, as many of you know, Councilman Grocott is undergoing treatment for cancer, um, and we uh, wish him well, we're thinking of him, and uh, we hope to have him back soon. Um, so for myself, I, again, brought some visuals. Um, if we could pull those up. Let's see. There we go. Nope. That's okay. Just hit present. Um, there you go. So um, this week, or, or, or since the last council meeting, um, I uh, joined the CCAG board. Uh, I'm representing both the city of San Carlos and the transportation authority on which I also serve. Um, Bob was the past chair of the of CCAG and Mark served on CCAG, so um, they don't need uh, 
to be told what CCAG does, but uh, just for the benefit of the public, CCAG um, helps to organize um, a lot of government functions across the entire county, Un unlike some counties where you have big cities like San Francisco, San Jose, or Oakland. San Mateo County is made up of 20 small cities and that have to do a lot of coordination. This is a list of um, a lot of the types of functions that um, CCAG uh, uh, serves for the broader San Mateo County community. Um, I'm excited to be on this board. I, I participated in the meeting, uh, board meeting this month where we mostly talked about um, the executive director and gave her her annual review, which I wasn't very much use of because since I had just joined the board, but um, I also uh, participated in a um, training session, um, kind of CCAG 101. So um, I'm very interested to, to dig in and uh, I'm meeting with their staffer on stormwater issues uh, later this week. Um, I also had the opportunity to meet with a company called OpenGov, which is a software company based in Redwood City. And what they're focused on is providing um, software solutions for municipal governments that allow the go um, governments to put their budget data online in a way that citizens can really understand it. So it, it comes in the form of graphs where you can interact with, dig down, understand um, how money is being spent, um, and you can dig in to, you know, specific, you can compare year over year, you can compare um, just basically how, how your tax money flows into the system and how it's spent. This is an example from one of their clients, which is the city of Sausalito. They have a, a, t a ton of clients across the country and many in the Bay Area. Um, it also, for our own staff, they provide analytical tools to be able to run budgeting and um, lots of different um, costing scenarios. So I thought it was very interesting. I, I hope that you know we've set up a, a website um, subcommittee and I hope it's something that we take a look at. It's actually a pretty um, a cheap solution and I think um, it's not only pretty slick, but I think it, it creates a lot of benefit for both the public and staff. <coughs> Um, I wanted to note that um, this is the 17th annual San Carlos Week of the Family, which started over the weekend. Um, the Week of the Family is a community-run uh, event by volunteers that um, seeks to create activities um, for people to connect with their family, however you define your family. Um, this is an example of some of the activities that are happening this week. There's a um, website here where you can learn all the different types of activities. There's a bocce ball tournament, there's a scavenger hunt. I was told, um, I spoke to one of the organizers today and um, they said there's, um, they're excited about um, the family history night on um, Thursday, which allows people to learn about how to catalog their family history and they're hoping um, they can get some more signups for that, but they've, uh, they're off to a great start. They had a, a big turnout. Uh, yesterday at a theater um, event with over 200 people who attended. Um, so I really applaud them for all their hard work uh, and hope that others will um, find opportunities to connect with your family uh, in one of these many events. Um, in my time on the city council, I've been fortunate enough to kind of treat my role as a volunteer activity. And so I haven't, I haven't drawn a salary, I'm just simply, um, donated the money back to the city. Um, but as mayor, I thought rather than do that, I, I'd like to donate my salary each month to a different community organization in the hopes of highlighting that organization and um, encouraging other people to get involved and potentially to make a donation themselves. So this month, um, I've decided to donate my salary to um, the San Carlos Lions Club. And I wanted to just take a quick moment to talk about a few things about the San Carlos Lions Club for those of you who may not know. So the, San, the Lions Club in general is the largest service organization in the world with over 1.4 million members in 210 countries. Um, San Carlos Lions Club is made up of um, 50 people. It was founded in 1938. Uh, with the focus of collecting eyeglasses and redistributing them to individuals in third world countries who are unable to afford glasses. Uh, the San Carlos Lions Club does a lot of great volunteer activities. Um, along with the Kiwanis and the Rotary Club, they run the Caring Cupboard, which is a nonprofit organization that provides um, food to low-income seniors in San Carlos. Uh, they plant trees in city parks and provide um, uh, city buildings um, with, uh, with California and U.S. flags. They donate to help the 4-H club, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, the Sojourn for the Past, the Lions Veterans Charities, and many other organizations in and outside of San Carlos. 
Um, this is one thing my kids love, which they, they host the annual um, Easter egg hunt um, for kids age four to 11. They have a student speaker contest and they provide three scholarships to graduating high school students in San Carlos to attend college. Um, once a month, a dedicated group of lions goes out and cleans the freeway um, at the entrance to San Carlos. They hold several fundraisers each year, a, a tri-tip feed in the fall, um, a crab feed, which is later this week, um, and they run the hamburger and hot dog booth, um, as well as the popcorn and cotton candy snow cone booth at Hometown Days. Uh, they work hard, they also have lots of fun. Um, they participate in Chicken's Ball, um, and uh, they um, put on a lobster feed um, in September. So I think they're a great community organization. Um, if you're interested in getting involved with the Lions, um, there's a website, sancarloslionsclub.org, and um, they uh, have, a, as I mentioned, an annual crab feed um, on uh, Saturday, and um, tickets, I believe, are still available. Lastly, um, this photo was sent to me by uh, Susan Hanna, who owns a range for comfort. Um, I know we've had a lot of really stormy weather over the past two weeks. I wanted to um, thank Jay and his team for all their hard work in both um, putting out information to the public um, and for securing um, city facilities to make sure that we didn't have a lot of flooding or negative repercussions from, from all the stormy weather. I thought um, this picture of a Rainbow over Laurel Street was a nice, a nice way to, to end the storm. So thanks a lot, Jay and team. All right, um, moving on to item uh, 4B, staff comments, Mr. Mulpey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just two uh, quick uh, reports here. Uh, first, I'd like to make the community aware of an opportunity to continue the dialogue with our uh, Chief of Police, Greg Rothis, uh, about uh, the issue of burglaries in town. So if you have any more questions uh, for the Chief, you'll have an opportunity to participate in a Twitter town hall uh, next Tuesday, February 2nd, from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, by tweeting uh, Ask SC Police Chief. Uh, and you'll be able to ask questions from seven to eight and the chief will stay on answering those questions uh, for as long as necessary. I also wanted to take the opportunity to uh, thank uh, Yvette Hall, our uh, interim city clerk who's been helping out the last six months while our uh, city clerk, uh, Crystal Moy, has been on uh, maternity leave. This will be Yvette's last meeting uh, with us before Crystal uh, returns later. Uh, this week, so thank you very much. It's not easy to be uh, to come in and have to hit the ground running and be a fill-in, but uh, Yvette's done a great job for us, and we'll, I know we'll all miss her uh, around City Hall. Yeah. Thank you very much, Yvette. Great job, Yvette. Likewise. Um, Thanks for your patience. Oh, yeah, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, one thing I had uh, uh, forgotten to mention uh, during comments is. Um, are we planning, and but Jeff's comment about Greg's uh, Twitter meeting reminded me of it. Are we planning on having um, an agendized item to talk about uh, uh, the burglary situation in San Carlos and have the police chief come in and discuss things with us and perhaps look at changes and additions and whatnot to his resources? I seem to recall we talked about doing that last December, but I'm not, I haven't seen it on the calendar yet. Yeah, there, there will be an item on an upcoming agenda in February. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, moving on to item 5A, presentation on Plan Bay Area 2040, updating the sustainable community strategy for the plan for transit, land use, housing, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the Bay Area. Al. Representative from the Association of Bay Area Governments comes up and uh, makes a presentation uh, to you this evening. There we go. Um, I thought I'd make <clears throat> just some brief introductory remarks. Um, we've had a very good strong working relationship with the Association of Bay Area Governments over the years, very collaborative in terms of, uh, you know, they're reaching out to the city and other, our city and other cities and helping to develop the regional policy that makes sense for the city of San Carlos and, and other cities in the region. And um, <clears throat> the uh, Plan Bay Area comes out of Assembly Bill 375, which was uh, intended to uh, uh, 
uh, help sustainability in our region and, and throughout the state. And so uh, what I'd like to do is introduce Pedro Galval from ABAG, and then um, Lisa Porras, our uh, principal planner, will also be talking just briefly about uh, how we connect into Plan Bay Area through our priority development area. So with that, I'd like to introduce Pedro. Hello, good evening, members of the City Council, Mayor. My name is Pedro Galvao, and I'm a regional planner with the Association of Bay Area Governments. First, thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, so I want to walk you through Plan Bay Area, where we are in the process, what it is, and what it means for San Carlos. So um, first off, a little bit about who we are. We are the Association of Bay Area Governments. We're the regional land use planning agency for the Bay Area. We're putting this together with the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, or MTC, which is the regional um, transportation planning agency for the Bay Area. So Plan Bay Area is really a nine county, 101 city plan. It impacts every city in the region. And it's a way to address our shared concerns, um, things that cities can't address just locally. They include the cost of housing, maintaining our quality of life, maintaining our existing infrastructure, managing traffic and improving transit, maintaining local land use of planning decisions and protecting our environment. In the spring of 2015, ABAG and the uh, Metropolitan Transportation Commission held a series of workshops throughout the region um, with that were open to the public to figure out what are some of the issues that the public felt needed to be addressed in this iteration of the plan. And so what you see here are some of the issues that were most commonly identified, and they include jobs, maintaining them and preserving them, affordable housing, transit, water. Um, so what Plan Bay Area does is it's really a roadmap for the Bay Area cities to maintain their local character while adapting to future population growth. And so it helps the economy by helping cities plan for future jobs and providing data on that. It informs um, local decision making around housing, like how much housing to expect and where to think about putting that. And it supports strategic transportation investments to help decrease traffic, congestion, improve air quality, um, and increase transportation options. So as Al mentioned, Plan Bay Area came about out of SB 375, which aims to decrease the state's overall greenhouse gas emissions by tying transportation planning with land use planning at a regional level. So what it did is it unified two existing planning processes. One is the regional transportation plan, where um, that has been traditionally put together by MTC, and the regional housing needs allocation, which is traditionally put together by ABAG. And we implement that through a framework of priority development areas and priority conservation areas. And there will be a little more on that later. So how do we translate this regional vision to local cities and counties? Well, we do it by really encouraging growth in housing and jobs in places that cities have identified where they would like to grow, um, also known as priority development areas. These are places that are existing, um, that have pretty good or will have very high quality transit in the near future, um, where we would like to see the growth of housing and jobs. Um, on the transportation side, MTC is focusing most of the region's transportation investments in maintaining our existing infrastructure while making focused investments in areas that need it the most. So we translate this regional vision locally by encouraging cities to adopt priority development areas. Again, and these are existing places that have high quality transit that are um, that either are walkable or aiming to be walkable for growth in housing and jobs. They work together with priority conservation areas, which are also locally adopted, places where um, cities have identified where they would like to preserve their um, it's recreational space, agricultural lands, uh, maybe it's area that serves specific cultural functions. Um, 
and in tandem, they support Plan B area implementation locally. The, this is a truly regional framework in that throughout the Bay Area that are over 188 priority development areas and 165 priority conservation areas. And as you can see from that map, every county has some. Um, almost every city has either a priority development area or a priority conservation area. So the way we bring Plan Bay Area about is really through extensive engagement. And we engaging local governments is really critical to the plan success. So we're constantly checking in with local planning staff um, about, about the numbers that we're putting out for housing and jobs growth. We invite stakeholders to take part in various working groups that we have regionally, such as the Regional Advisory Working Group. And through this consultation, whether um, it's council presentations, um, people coming to workshops we, we hold, or our working groups, we take your feedback and then we refine our plan accordingly and present it to you again. Generally, it, it's, there's three steps to that, um, which I'll go over as I talk about the, the schedule. Um, but we ensure that we get the voices of local jurisdictions heard in this process. So a couple of things to note about Plan Bay Area 2040 is that unlike the first time we adopted Plan Bay Area, this is really a strategic update, which means that in this four-year update, it's limited in scope and that we will not be giving out a new regional housing need allocation. That will be done with the next iteration of Plan Bay Area because that's on an eight-year cycle and this one's on a four-year cycle. There are five major milestones to Plan Bay Area. The first, which um, was done in early 2015 and concluded in the fall of last year, was figuring out the broad-based goals and targets, policy goals and targets that the plan is trying to achieve. Um, once we did that, well, simultaneously as that was happening, we've been developing our forecasts of jobs, population, and housing. Um, we've put out um, some preliminary figures for planning staff to review on that, and we're, we continue to develop that. MTC is doing a transportation, a transportation, a travel demand model, which looks at the way that people get to and from work, to and from home in the region under different circumstances. And they've put together a transportation revenue forecast that forecasts how much money we'll have for transportation investment through 2040. Um, another aspect of the plan is looking at a new set of transportation investments that are being proposed to and how they relate to the plan's overall policy objectives. Do these plans bring us closer to the greenhouse gas emissions targets um, that we're trying to achieve in the region? Or are these, are these transportation investments really going to push us further away? So they're deciding those right now. Eventually, we put these transportation projects together with, uh, with land use scenarios or land use policies to show different ways that the region can grow while still achieving its greenhouse gas emissions cuts. And so we're in the process of developing those scenarios right now, and there will be more on that later. But eventually we're going to be presenting them to you. We're going to be taking your feedback and figuring out what's the best aspects of each one of these scenarios that we want to carry forward to come up with a preferred scenario. And once we have that, um, which we're aiming to have by fall of this year, we'll get into the environmental impact report process and we hope to adopt Plan Bay Area by mid-2017. So on scenarios, which is where we are in the process, is scenarios really are Different, they represent different ways that the region can grow, different strategies for focusing growth, for focusing transportation investments with the overall aim to meet our, our goals and targets, specifically our greenhouse gas emissions. And so each scenario has, um, provides a different vision for the region. So we've come up so far with scenario concepts. And these are called concepts because they're not quite scenarios yet. They represent three broad-based visions for what the region could look like um, in 2040. So the first one looks at focusing growth in housing and jobs in main streets. And um, it's the closest to a business as usual scenario in that it's very car-centric. It, 
depends a lot on technology for achieving our greenhouse gas emissions target. The second scenario is closest to what we currently have with Plan Bay Area, which focuses growth in the three largest cities, as well as in places that have really high quality transit, particularly along um, the Caltrain lines and BART stations. And the third scenario is the most focused of them all, and that focuses growth in housing and jobs in the three largest cities and transportation investments to get people to and from those cities. It's more of people will be commuting to those cities and or being housed in them. So we've developed these concepts. We presented them in workshops in the fall of last year. We're in the process of developing appropriate policy strategies that could get us to achieve our targets. Um, and we're going to build them. And there's a little computer there because we're going to be running it through our land use model and our travel demand model to figure out, will we get our emissions cuts? Will this actually move the region in the direction we want it to move? Once we've evaluated those scenarios, we'll be presenting them to you. Um, we don't have a date set yet, but it'll be around May or June of this year. And so just as a quick recap, we've developed the concepts in the fall. We are going to be presenting the draft scenarios to you in May or June of this year, and there will also be a series of public workshops. In the fall, we hope to select a preferred scenario, which is, again, going to unify the best aspects of those three visions um, and adopt it and start the environmental impact report process. Um, on the transportation side, we've completed our transportation revenue forecast. MTC is in the process of looking at operations and needs for the region through 2040. And they're also assessing new transportation investments that are coming up. So with that, I'm going to introduce Lisa Pores, who's going to talk about what this means locally. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. As Pedro mentioned, um, ABAG staff um, reaches out and works with um, planning staff from local jurisdictions to get a lot of the information it needs to prepare this uh, sustainable community strategy uh, for our region. So um, if we pause for a minute and look at um, San Carlos, um, as Pedro mentioned, um, a lot of the cities, every city almost has a priority development area. So I'd like to take this opportunity um, for those of the, you that already know this will be familiar, but in case you don't know, San Carlos adopted its plan, uh, priority development area in 2007. Uh, it consists of about 150 acres and basically runs along our two-mile stretch of El Camino Real um, or the Grand Boulevard. Um, a lot of the area encompasses um, our mixed-use zoning districts. Um, so when um, ABAG put out the call for cities to submit uh, for priority development areas, um, this area Area, um, was a very, very good fit because it's an area that's close to transit. We have transit that runs up and down El Camino Real, served by Samtrans. And then we also have the Caltrain stop um, located um, at San Carlos Avenue and El Camino Real. Um, the area is zoned um, for housing. We memorialized that through our the zoning ordinance update that was done in 2011. Um, so what we're actually seeing, and this is um, a lot of the data that ABAG is requesting um, from local planning staff, is, well, what, what's been going on in our priority development area? What's um, happening on the implementation side is a majority of the growth and our housing growth occurring within our PDA. And um, based upon um, recent development applications, what's currently in the pipeline, um, we can say that, yes, it is. Of all the um, new housing growth that's occurring in this 81% is happening in our priority development area. So this image here basically identifies um, you know, all of the units that have been approved. You'll notice the larger orange dots on the map represent the Transit Village, Village Project, Wheeler Project, um, a, a pretty significant size condominium uh, project um, on the 700 block of Walnut Street. It identifies what units are pending, um, as well as new commercial development um, that is in 
included in part of the um, Wheeler um, Plaza project and Transit Village project. Um, so this information is useful as we look um, ahead and, and, and work with ABAG and look at the different scenarios to see where it makes sense locally for us to concentrate our growth um, given um, the um, SB 375's um, goals to reduce greenhouse gases um, from passenger vehicles. So I thought this would be interesting uh, to point out to uh, the council and the community. And what's not shown on here are the public improvement, three significant public improvement projects that have occurred within our PDA, which is, of course, the East Side Connect, the El Camino Real Landscaping and Lighting Project, as well as the construction that's currently underway at Arroyo and El Camino Real, which is a segment of our Grand Boulevard um, component. Um, so thank you. I'll hand it over to Pedro. Thank you so much, Lisa. So um, with that, that really wraps up the presentation. Um, there are various ways you can get involved. Either you can sign up for our mailing list, you can email our planning directors, um, and this information is also available for members of the public who wish to be involved as well. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, questions for Mr. Galvao? Um, Ron? Thanks. Thanks, Cameron. Uh, thank you, Pedro. Nice uh, presentation, and, and as well from you, Lisa. Uh, the only um, question I have is I didn't see anything, and I don't really know whether or not it's been, I'm sure it's been thought about, but I, I wonder if there is the potential for a water transportation component. I know that we've got some ferries here and there. I haven't heard much about it. Is there some thought or planning going into uh, water transportation uh, since we've got such a big bay and limited space on our bridges? That's a really good question. Um, so water is a new area for us. It's not something that we've had traditional purview over, but we are starting to get our feet wet <laughs> um, by, by um, working with this. So under ABAG is the San Francisco Estuary Partnership. And they are actually starting to work with various jurisdictions on drought mitigation plans, which includes water transportation. Um, that is still in the very early stages, so um, it remains to be seen what comes out of it. But we're starting to work with local jurisdictions as well as local utilities on doing that and making sure that we're not overstepping our bounds and that utilities have the proper role in those processes. Um, we're also organizing a water summit. Um, it's going to be in October of this year. We haven't formally announced it yet as we're still gathering per um, participants, but um, that is happening. And at that summit, we hope to announce new policies that we might pursue regionally that would be appropriate for us. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Mark? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Pedro and Lisa. Uh, good job. I had um, <clears throat> a number of questions uh, sparked by some of the things that you each said. Um, one is, uh, first one is, Pedro, do you know roughly how many jobs are projected to be added in San Mateo County over the next five or 10 years? Generally, so we have projections 2013, and general, that was the last set of official numbers we put out. And while we do the 10-year growth allocations, I don't, uh, I don't know it off the top of my head because I'm, I'm usually thinking in 2040 terms, but I can get back to you on that. Okay. Yeah, um you don't need to get back to me on that. I had heard through from somebody else that over the, something in the five or ten year horizon, it was something on the order of about 100,000 new jobs. Does that strike you as reasonable? That, that sounds reasonable. Um, I have to tell you, when, when I first heard that, I was like, wow, nobody's building anywhere near 50,000 new homes right. or living units, e even with turnover and population. Um, which kind of is the background to my, my next question. I'd be interested in ABAG's both thoughts and reactions to, uh, you know, uh, there is a growing anti-development uh, theme in a number of peninsula communities, uh, San Carlos as well. Um, I, I think the, in Redwood City it tends to get a fair amount of press right now just because they're undergoing a lot of construction. Um, how do you see that playing into some of the goals that, that you guys are trying to promulgate? Because they would seem to be antithetical to it and have to get addressed one way or another. Right. And I, and so 
having th those voices were present in the first iteration of the Plan Bay area, and we completely we expect that to continue to be present throughout this this one. Um, a lot of what we've been doing is education. I mean, there's a lot of mis there was a lot of misconception in the first time that we adopted this plan about the role of the regional agencies. And many people thought that we were usurping local land use control and telling cities what to build and where to build. Whereas we see our role as much more facilitating that conversation and helping cities identify where they would like to grow. But ultimately that decision is up to the cities. And so um, with movements that are anti-growth, we really see our role as coming to city councils, doing workshops to talk about what does growth mean, what does it look like locally. We've, um, we often at our executive board show um, how various jurisdictions have implemented priority development areas and places that are large and small. And for you know places like Petaluma, for example, that are relatively small, you can see that they've Growth doesn't need to mean a 30, 40 story condo um, that's going to come up right by your single family home. It, it needs to be something that's appropriate locally and each community has its own answer for that. And so what ABAG is trying to do is highlight those success stories and, and really show people that, you know, growth isn't the nightmare, unless you want it to be the nightmare, and that's the that's the direction that the council takes. It's really up to each community to figure out what it means for them, but we show them that there are options and that there isn't just one way to grow, and so that's how we've been addressing that mostly. Um, l last question, uh, at least for now. Um, in your education and outreach discussions, do you discuss, how can I put this, um, what would be the consequences of, of of not growing or not growing in a planned fashion? Um, because I mean, implicit in what you've been talking about is is growth. And leaving that issue aside for a moment, um, that's a that's sort of a testable assumption. Not having it has consequences. Do you discuss that with folks at all? Yes, absolutely. Um, in every planning document that we put out, we have a discussion about what not growing means. And generally, a lot of the problems that I that I laid out earlier, you know, cost of housing, uh, maintaining our existing infrastructure has to do with growth. And if we don't grow, um, our region is going to become less affordable. Um, jobs are going to start to move out of the region, so there will be an economic impact. Um, and we we put numbers to that, and we really highlight that with our various reports. So, for example, we have we put out two recently, one called the State of the Region, that looks at regional planning issues for the Bay Area, um, and it does have detailed a detailed discussion on what not growing means, and the other one is people, places, and prosperity, where we also talk about what not growing means, and we do put numbers associated with that um, so people can see that not growing will have consequences for the affordability of the region, but also its general livability for future generations. Interesting. I'm, I'm sure you have distributed those, and I, uh, as you were describing them, I, I couldn't remember them. And I'd love to get, I'd love to get copies or links to them if they're online. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mark. Other questions? If not, thank you very much, Lisa and Pedro. Thank you so much. And we will move on to item five B, presentation of the San Carlos Chamber of Commerce on the pro on the proposal for a year-round farmers market. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and uh, members of the Council. My name is Dave Bouchard. I'm the CEO of the San Carlos Chamber of Commerce. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to be here this evening to uh, present our idea. We've been talking about the possibility of a year on farmer's market somewhere in, in the community, um, and it's long been asked for by both community residents and, and by uh, market vendors as well. Um, since 2004, let me see here if I can get this right here. Not sure if I, oh, here we go. There you go. 
Since 2004, the Santa Carlos Chamber of Commerce has operated the seasonal farmer's market known as Hot Harvest Nights on Thursday evenings from May through September on the 700 block of Laurel Street in downtown San Carlos. The weekly event is permitted on an annual basis through the issuance of a special event permit by the city, and since its inception, Hot Harvest Nights has proven a popular event attracting weekly crowds in excess of 3,000 people. Created by the Chamber of Commerce and the City of San Carlos Redevelopment Agency to promote economic vitality in the downtown, the market accommodates approximately 60 vendors each week selling fresh fruit and produce, as well as meat and poultry, um, eggs, cheese, uh, select um, prepared foods. Uh, Hard Harvest Nights has provided a valuable and attractive amenity for San Carlos residents and has exposed visitors to the myriad of merchants and restaurants operated in the downtown. Uh, with downtown San Carlos as busy as it is in the evenings and given the impact of limited parking on downtown merchants, we are proposing to discontinue <laughs> hot harvest nights on Thursday evenings and replace it with a year-round farmer's market on Sundays from 10.30 until 2.30. We believe that replacing the Thursday evening market with a Sunday daytime farmer's market will help alleviate congestion alleviate congestion in the downtown on Thursday evenings and additionally the influx of residents and visitors to downtown on a typically slow business day Sunday will, will benefit excuse me <coughs> will benefit restaurants and retailers our proposal for a year-round farmers market on Sunday mornings will require closing the street one hour prior to the start of the market maintaining the street closure for an hour after the market closes in order to accommodate vendor setup and and breakdown our proposal also includes shifting the layout of the market from the 700 block on Laurel Street to a portion of both the 600 and 700 blocks of Laurel in addition to a section of Cherry Street for the purpose of preserving easy access to the free public parking lots in the vicinity in addition to valley, the valley stand at the uh, former food drill site that will be open during the Wheeler Plaza construction. The proposed layout excuse me, uh, preserves the number of vendors that the market can accommodate at about 60 each week. We are also assuming that in the off season, essentially the winter months, the market can be scaled back to just the 600 block of Laurel Street, any portion of possibly Cherry Street accommodating closer to 30 to 40 vendors. We propose starting the year-round farmers market on Sunday, May 1st. Uh, this map shows the uh, proposed layout for the market. Um, to the top of the screen, El Camino Real, to the far left is um, San Carlos Avenue, and to the uh, right, Olive Street. So you'll see there where um, the market would be located is highlighted in yellow. Public parking places are also highlighted. Uh, Sam Trans Transit Center parking area. And um, public parking behind the 700 block, as well as the uh, Free Valley parking area. We know that expanding the farmer's market, excuse me, we know that uh, expanding the farmer's market to two blocks in the downtown area, changing the day of the week on which it takes place and extending it to year round is a significant change for the community. With that in mind, chamber and city staff conducted extensive community outreach to businesses and residents, inviting everyone's feedback. I personally delivered letters explaining our proposal to 70 business owners on the 6 and 700 blocks of Laurel Street. We received positive feedback on the proposal, in particular from residents, um, uh, Bow Wow Meow, Laurel Street Arts, the Reading Bug and Society Skate Shop, which is on the 600 block, the other three on the 700 block, each expressed concerns that a Sunday market would impact them because they do a significant amount of business on Sundays and they feel their customers will not be able to reach them easily during the farmer's market hours. However, we believe there will be ample parking available on Sundays rather than Thursdays since fewer businesses in the downtown area are open, most uh, notably banks and other service industry, uh, service businesses. 
Um, additionally, beginning in the summer of uh, 2016, uh, 100 free public parking spaces will be made available to San Carlos residents on Sundays at the San Trans Transit Center parking area. These spaces can be utilized by both vendors and the public. To gather feedback from San Carlos residents, uh, city staff posted a Shape San Carlos poll on the city's website and promoted it through their social media. The poll received significant attention with 196 respondents submitting lengthy messages in support of the project, as well as constructive feedback and concerns. The figure to the right on this slide uh, summarizes the number of in favor of, the, um, of and opposed to the proposal. Some common concerns include uh, that Belmont already has a Sunday farmer's market, um, there's already limited parking, and uh, the added congestion on an otherwise easy day to navigate downtown San Carlos. Uh, this slide here shows a proposed logo that we would uh, adopt for the, for the new farmer's market. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the old um, Hot Harvest Nights farmer's market, and uh, obviously that would not uh, work well with the uh, the new concept, but we we would become known as uh, San Carlos Farmers Market, and it would be promoted as such. Um, in conclusion, um, Hot Harvest Nights Farmers Market has enjoyed 12 successful seasons. On um, wait a minute, I missed a slide here. Hold on, excuse me. I'm going to go back one here. Um, just in a couple of uh, slides here, I want to give a couple of testimonials we've received over the years through Yelp and other, other means. Uh, this particular slide addresses the concerns about our conflict, conflicting with the Belmont Farmer's Market on Sundays. Um, in San Carlos, you can actually enjoy your coffee, wine, um, and food at a table overlooking the whole event or while you're waiting for someone to join you there. And uh, for many years, Hot Harvest Nights has had a great reputation and is a popular destination for Bay Area residents. So in conclusion, Hot Harvest Nights Farmer's Market has enjoyed 12 successful seasons on Thursday nights in downtown San Carlos. Having a year-round farmer's market has long been a request of vendors and residents alike. Given existing parking constraints in the downtown and the concerns of business owners in that area, that um, about too much congestion on Thursday evenings is detrimental to their business, moving the market to Sundays during the day has significant appeal. Uh, another, uh, I might note, um, when we do the Thursday farmer's market, some of you may be aware that uh, it's in the middle of the day, the middle of the week, and we have to uh, clear the streets of many, many cars, and sometimes all those cars do not uh, get removed before our uh, vendors need to set up. So uh, consequently, we've over the years had to tow a few cars off the street, and this would hopefully eliminate that, uh, that from happening. Um, and uh, the Chamber's requesting basically um, from the city uh, that, uh, we, that the city issue a special event permit on a pilot one-year basis. That permit is in process currently. Uh, this will allow us to test the Sunday market concept, adjusting it throughout the year to suit the needs of downtown businesses and the community. And we can also expand and contract the market based on the number of vendors, um, uh, depending on the time of year, and also adapt the layout to construction and special events in the downtown area. With that, um, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dave. Mark. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Dave. Um, actually, my first question uh, is for staff. Jeff, uh, this is not an action item tonight. It, will it actually be brought back to the council for approval, or is this something where you're looking for our feedback and staff will be making the decision on whether or not to issue the permit? This uh, would be coming back to council uh, based on the feedback we received tonight. Okay, thank you. Um, Dave, the a um, um, couple of things in no particular order. Um, have you did you consider doing a pilot program of less than a year? It does it, obviously if it gets too short, it becomes difficult because you're sort of switching gears. Yeah. Um, but a year is a relatively long time to do something if it turns out that it has some unforeseen problem. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I hadn't anticipated that question, but um, I guess it, it's a possibility. It's always a possibility. The thing is that when we work uh, with the vendors, they like to commit to something for you know at least a season. And our season has been, you know, 20 weeks. Um, if we, if they can commit to something longer than that, because they've got other markets that they can be a part of, um, it's kind of, you know, puts a little bit of a, a constraint on on our being able to operate. Well, actually, that uh, that gives me an intro, a good a good answer or insight there is that uh, it may not be optimal, but clearly the 20 week season works because you're able to attract vendors. So right. So that's at least a another marker for how long something needs to be. Um, the, uh, uh, I noticed it in your business outreach, and I appreciate you, you disclosing this. I, I actually, I've been talking to some of the businesses in those blocks in Laurel Street recently about some other things, and uh, I must have run into all four of the no's because they were, they were quite um, uh, concerned about it mm -hmm. and, and wanted to talk to me about it. Um, given that this is essentially a commercial activity that we're talking about here, it's not something this, the city is doing. We're, we're allowing the street to be closed. Has there ever been any discussion about, uh, for lack of a better term, making it worth their while to accept? Um, you know, the, some give them some financial stake in it. Does that affect things? Is that something that can be done? Mm, I really don't know. I haven't really given that question uh, any thoughts. The first, it's uh, you know come up. So, um, I would say you know the, the benefit for the market is actually to bring business to the downtown, and that's how the businesses do benefit. You know, on the contrary, some will um, will more than likely see you know some inconvenience for their customers getting directly to them. Uh, a couple of the uh, businesses that I know that you mentioned, um, I've ta also talked to at length, and um, the concern was you know having to put up with that inconvenience to them for an entire year. Twenty weeks was. You know, doable, and that's uh, one of the reasons why we're proposing that we uh, essentially do a, you know, for starting in May, do basically in 20 weeks, 22 weeks down the road, shift to a smaller market just on the 600 block. That's about the same time that some of the vendors don't have their their fresh produce. Um, they're not growing at that point uh, of the season, um, so it would be essentially the same. That they're that they're experiencing now in terms of the length of time uh, that the street is closed uh, for roughly 20 weeks before we contract. But we essentially are proposing the the two blocks, um, as was you know mentioned in the presentation, to preserve access to those parking areas in the vicinity, um, but also to give us the real estate that we need to accommodate the vendors that. Uh, that want to participate in, in our market. Right. Um, uh, my next question was something I hadn't, I have to admit, I'd never thought about before. It was uh, sparked by one of your testimonial comments. Uh, did, did the chamber look at actually holding the farmer's market um, in the Caltrain parking lot? Uh, we've had conversations with them, but with the Caltrain, um, with the Transit Village uh, about to be, uh, you know, break ground and uh, be under construction during that time. It's uh, it's not feasible now, at least not for the next year or so. So the hundred spaces that they're willing to provide, that's that's not enough to to uh, host a, a, a farmers market. It, it probably would be, but I know I'm, from what I understand, there's uh, arrangement between the city and and uh, Sam Trans for that property to be available to, for public access for public parking. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. I thought that was a deal you had cut with Sam Trans, oh, the no. chamber had cut with Sam Trans. Oh, no, okay. no, no. All right, that, that, that's a different issue. Um, okay, that's all I had for now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Ron? Uh, thank you, Cameron. Just a couple of questions, David. Uh, nice presentation, by the way. Yeah. Um, uh, you answered my first question, was which was, what are you going to call it? <laughs> it's not hard. Not hard. Nice. Not hot, not nights. Right. Um, I, what I am concerned about, it, it, I, I, obviously, you guys have probably given a lot of thought, is the vendor availability on a Sunday, because there is one in Belmont. I assume there's a lot more uh, uh, farmer's markets on Sundays at various locations around the peninsula. Mm -hmm. uh, is that... Is that not really a problem, or are there just so many of them that they're grateful to have another outlet? 
I, I, to my knowledge, uh, when there is a, a market available that they want to participate in, they'll create, you know, basically another team to mm. to uh, set up at that market. So they can. There's some farmers that do several markets on the same day, uh, as an example. Um, so I'm not sure the competition is necessarily going to be a problem for either the farmer or for or for us uh, as the operator of this market here. Um, I had heard, and I don't, I can't remember where I heard it, but I had heard that there was some discussion about having the the farmers market on in South on South Laurel, some portion of South Laurel. Did, were there any discussions to that extent, or did I hear wrong? Or yeah, at one point uh, I did. I, bro I broached the topic, and uh, I think the concern at that time was issues around parking mm -hmm. uh, in the residential areas and lack of parking in the South Laurel area. Okay. All right. Well, that's all I have, Cameron. Thanks, Ron. Bob? Um, Dave, um, you indicated that you think you'll have 30 to 40 vendors in the off-season. I, I, I mean, a farmer's market to me is fresh produce. Mm -hmm. um, so I understand in, in the summer you got fresh produce, but the, the, there's vendors that, that come in with packaged items or bakery goods or honey or whatever. Isn't it basically going to be that way in the winter? Uh, well, uh, you know, from, I don't have a, shipping them in from Chile or something. The, the, I don't have a lot of experience with year-round markets, but what I have seen is that there's a variety. There still is a variety. There's other products. Fruits, there's still some fresh fruits and vegetables out oh, there. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. There are winter crops. Yeah. Excuse me. There are winter, winter crops. crops yeah. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah. like I said, well, again, I, I think the only thing that, does, that has been brought up is the, the length of time. I mean, we did it for 20 weeks, and I, I'm. I mean, I understand what you said about folks committing, and they committed to 20 weeks, So, but now you're going to double it, in effect, or more than double it. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I don't, that's the only question I have, whether it should be 26 weeks or something, because basically. But then again, you're basically not going to have a winner. You wouldn't have, well, you, you might. It just depends on if it works well for the first 26. I guess we'd say, okay, shoot it for the next 26. Uh, yeah. But, but um, I don't know. That, that, that I haven't come up with that one yet so no. anyway thanks thanks Bob um, thanks Dave for the presentation as you know you and I have talked about this bit um, I wanted to follow up on some of the questions um, the there it was a, at one point talk about um, potentially or incorporating some outdoor dining um, mm -hmm. into the market um, potentially as either part of the market or something that can continue on when the market is, is closing down. Um, is that still on the table? Could you give us an update of where those conversations are? I think, you know, at this point we wanted, we wanted to uh, essentially just um, uh, present the concept of, of the market and maybe down the road at some point um, uh, propose doing something a little bit more extensive than that. Uh, you know, we put it on the poll, I think, the um, uh, Shape San Carlos poll, and it got mixed reaction, mm -hmm. um, closing the the street for that length of time. But but I, I can see where maybe down the road on, you know, once a month might be too often, but maybe once a quarter would be adequate. I, I do know that a lot of the restaurants uh, do plan on, uh, offering those that those that currently offer brunch and lunch and dinner business are going to benefit from the from the added uh, uh, foot traffic that this will generate and we've also heard from others that we've talked to in that area that don't com currently you know serve you know brunch or lunch uh, or would consider opening because that would give them an opportunity to, you know to you know serve a public that they haven't had a chance yeah. to serve to this point but as far as you know, closing the street for the extended time and having what we I guess we had called it open street Sundays, uh, that's something that could be considered down the road. Um, okay. All right. So we just didn't want to you know put yeah, too much no, out that, there. It makes sense to me. I just um, I still I still think it's an interesting concept to allow some kind of on street dining on a Sunday afternoon. Um, yeah. But so I, what I'm he hearing you say is it's it's on the table, but probably won't be part of the initial launch. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, and we want to kind of you know see how this how it goes initially before we jump into you know something else, and, and we're t totally open to it. In the past, you know, with the uh, Thursday night farmers market, uh, there have been other groups. Uh, the Parks and Rec Foundation has come to us and said, you know, we're going to set up down here, you know, take advantage of the crowd for a fundraiser. They yeah. did the um, Ferris wheel a couple mm -hmm. of times, and that worked out really well. So those kinds of things could certainly happen. 
um, and you know, we're totally open to you know working with uh, whoever might you know want to do that. Okay. Um, the another issue um, that's been brought up around the farmers market in the past is where the vendors park and taking over um, customer parking spots. Right. Uh, can you give us an update with what's happening with vendor parking? Well, one, one of the uh, reasons why we were looking at utilizing Cherry Street and closing it off at the alleys, uh, much like we do now with the uh, Art and Wine Fair, is that would be an area where some of the larger vehicles would park. So they'd be off of Laurel Street, but nearby you know, the, the market where they would be uh, setting up. So um, there would be a couple of side streets there that would be available for the larger vehicles. And then the others you know, would f certainly have access to the the lot across the street event when it is available, the uh, Sam, uh, Caltrain parking lot, the 100 spaces that are going to be developed for uh, public parking and available for public use. Um, but are, are we going to be specifically, the concern had been that vendor trucks were taking up spots that would otherwise be used for customers. Mm -hmm. For instance, the lot um, directly behind Laurel Street on the 700 block. Are, are vendor trucks going to be parking there? Well, hey, what we've done in the past, and I know that um, it, it probably is uh, less of an issue on a Sunday, but they could park along the east side of um, El Camino Real, which uh, during the week I think is a little more impacted uh, with, with um, either um, uh, you know, mer merchant or some other worker uh, parking. Um, and on Sundays, I'm not sure what it looks like now, unless there's a Giants game or something on a Sunday. I guess it, it can be, you know, impacted at that point in time. But we we often encourage them to park off site as far away as they can. That's you know within reasonable distance for them to walk back to their their booth. And I think it, you know, the east side of El Camino Real is one of those options that we've okay. always you know made available to them. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't sound. I, I guess what I what I'm trying to transmit to you is that um, this has been a problem in the past, mm -hmm. and I w would like it if it's not a problem in the future, particularly if you're changing it up. And so, if you could work to put together some kind of plan that's more than just encouraging the trucks, yeah. um, and and it's something to monitor going forward, because I part of I think there's a lot of different reasons to potentially move the market, but one is to try to. Um, change some of the things in the past that have been points of contention and so yeah. if I'd love to see that one addressed. Well I think the Samtrans garage might be a good option for you know the vehicles that aren't oversized that can actually park in that area so that would be one option as well. Okay. Um, the, this is another request which is um, you know I've I, I personally have gotten a couple um, uh, Notes from residents in the past, you know, a couple of months about just um, the general cleanliness of downtown and wanting to do more street cleaning. If we double, you know, uh, the number of days that we have a farmers market, I think it's going to get worse. I I also think that um, the uh, I forget. I lost my train of thought. But um, uh, what what I'm hoping is that. Um, that the chamber can potentially work with the city since this is a revenue generating opportunity um, to potentially look at um, pitching in for some additional street cleanings this year. Yeah. So I would hope that you could work with staff on that and see if you can find a way. Okay. Um, one last question for you, which is, so what are the kinds of things you're going to be looking at to know if this is successful or unsuccessful? And if we you know, talk about this, let's say six months or a year from now, well, I guess it'd be more like a year from now. Uh, how, what what are the what are the ways you're going to be able to determine if this was a hit or if it, if it was something we need to switch up? I, I think just uh, basically looking at how it might compare to what we were doing in the past in terms of uh, crowd and uh, attendance and um, a vendor following. Uh, and I know that you know while many of our vendors have, um, have that have been a part of our market for many years, a lot of them for the entire 12 years that it's been operating, um, have done very well here. They like doing business in San Carlos. It's very good for them. Um, and it's more profitable, conceivably, than, than other markets yeah. are. And I think mainly because it is in a, in a unique area, which is unlike other communities, it's in the downtown area where, 
a lot of people are, are coming to the area for other than, you know, the farmer's market. They're there to shop and to dine as well. Um, and it you know, kind of attracts maybe a higher a buying client, I guess, uh, from what I heard out anecdotally as well. Um, so I think, you know, if, if we can you know, attract a good number of vendors and, and the vendors do well financially, I think that's, you know, that's the first, you know, level of, um, level of su success that we, we, we would be looking for. Okay. That, you know, the community comes and they enjoy it. And, uh, you know, we've, we've had people at the end of the 20-week 20, 20 market, hot, farm, hot Harvest Nights, you know, as soon as it's over, they're disappointed that it's not continuing. And obviously, we can't continue for obvious reasons. It gets dark. And, um, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, we've you know, been looking for a year-round location, not only for the community, but for, for the vendors that we uh, participate with as well. Okay. And, you know, for the, the businesses that have expressed concerns about this being a hit to their business, I hope that you're staying in close contact with them and see what the direct impact is. And see, um, well, yeah, we'll definitely be. I, I think it's not just about, I mean, I think measuring, you know, how many people come to downtown, how much revenue it's generating, um, I think is good. But um, I think some of the issues with the farmer's market in the past has been that, you know, some of the business owners have, have raised concerns, and I would hate to see us either repeating or exacerbating those things. The hope is that the reason that we're doing this is that it's, um, as you said in your presentation, shifting you know, demand from a time when we had a lot of already a lot of demand in, in, on Laurel Street to a time when it's pretty quiet. But if, okay. if we're just repeating the same problems with the businesses, um, at least I, I'd like to know that, and I hope you guys are, are reaching out particularly to those that have expressed concerns. Yeah, and and you know I totally understand uh, the concern, and we'll work with you know the vent or the um, the merchants, the business owners to accommodate their their um, their issues as much as we possibly can. Um, uh, it's not our you know position to do this to hurt business. We want to help business, and uh, and we realize that there are one or two that that could be you know inconvenienced by this, and we want to certainly do what we can to work with them and make it less of a burden on them. Yeah. Okay. Um, my last comment is for Jeff and Al and staff. Um, you know, the big question about this was shown in the city survey results is around parking. Um, and I, I think I, I'm growing concerned when we see, you know, something in a chamber presentation that says, hey, we've got 100 spots over here that, you know, hasn't been part of sort of a comprehensive plan around what parking is going to be available, what's happening with Wheeler Plaza, how does this fit in, and some of the thing we have to evaluate when we think about this is like, well, what's the parking situation really going to look like in May? And I think there's a lot of disparate pieces that we've been told different parts of, but I would love to see kind of a comprehensive look at that as soon as possible. And I know the last meeting we established a parking subcommittee, but I think um, this issue, along with a lot of others, depend on you know what is really going to be available. How do we have something in writing from Sam Trans, et cetera, et cetera? So I hope that's something that we can take a look at soon. And and you will. That's in the works right now. Okay. Glad to hear it. Okay. Um, I see Mark's slide is on. You have a question, Mark? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A um, couple of follow-up questions. Um, actually, both for Dave and and for uh, Jeff. Um, did. Um, I saw that we tested in, uh, communi in the community outreach to see what the reaction was of moving it to Sunday. Have we ever done a uh, test to see what the overall reaction to the com of the community is to having a farmer's market, whether it's on Thursday or Sunday or whenever? In other words, how much support there is for it? I don't think we've ever tested that specific question, no. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll come back to why I asked that in a minute. And and uh, I had the same reaction that Cameron did in, in his last comment. In fact, I would probably go further, and I apologize for not thinking of this uh, before, but to me, I mean, my support for not only making this kind of change, but even, even for it to be frank, Dave, and I know I hadn't thought to mention this to you before when you and I talked about this, uh, uh, I, I'm concerned about whether or not, given the construction that's going on, can we afford to do farmer's market, period? And a sub-question sub to that is, can we afford to do farmer's market on Sunday as opposed to Thursday? Um, and, and so my position on that's going to hinge on this analysis that it sounds like staff is doing. But it, it's a pretty important one for me. Um, the, the, uh, uh, the reason I asked the question about what was the general level of support in the community if we'd ever tested that is, I like the farmer's market. 
Okay, but I have to admit when I looked at this poll result and it showed 57% yes and 33% no, and that was the narrower question about moving it to a Sunday. I was like, wow, that gives me a little bit pause, a little bit of a pause that a third of the people that responded think that this is not a good idea. They're clearly not a majority, but you know, it would make me a lot more comfortable if that number was a lot smaller than a third. Um, so it kind of got me thinking about it, is, does the community as a whole actually embrace this thing, or are we doing something that may be good for us individually, but isn't necessarily what the community wants to see happen? If I may, I, th I think it's a good point. I think it's also important to remember that this poll is opt-in, so this it's not a scientific survey, and it, it, it may be that folks who don't like this particular issue are motivated to do it. I, I think we should look at it, but I think a lot of it is just sort of the qualitative feedback, too, about you know specific reasons why people are concerned. So, I, I, I hear you. Uh, on the other hand, it's the information we have to go uh, with, yeah. and they're, they're, without launching for without launching into a a, a full blown scientific poll, which I don't think Dave wants to pay for, um, and I wouldn't <laughs> recommend that you do anyway. There's probably other ways we can sort of get a sense of what the overall reaction is in the community. But, and I just wanted to make the point that for me, besides parking, a third of the folks not being happy about moving it to Sunday is, gives me pause. And I think a good number of those were concerned about the Belmont <coughs> Farmer's Market and yeah. competing with them and, you know, and with the vendors that are participating in that market. And, you know, we wouldn't necessarily be, you know, um, pirating any vendors from any other markets necessarily. Uh, um, like I said, you know, they create, you know, they create more teams if they want to be a part of another on another market if it, if it, if it develops. So. All right. Uh, Ron? Yeah, I just had one more question. Um, David, you listed the common concerns. Are these in order of the, of the, you know, the most in any one category? In other words, did most people think that the Sunday market in Belmont yes, was, that was that by far, be impacted? By far, that was the oh, most. that was yeah. far and away the number one. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And I think, you know, we're going back to what I said earlier, we're unique uh, from other markets uh, along the peninsula that aren't in a Caltrain parking lot. I mean, we're in a downtown area where people like to come. Uh, we're not on a college campus. I mean, I understand those are really popular markets, but, you know, we, we want to be a little different, I think. And I, I, I would have thought it would have been the parking. Pardon? I would have thought it would have been the parking. Yeah. Well, I think you're know, probably pretty close, but I think the Belmont was more... I kind of scanned through them, and I, you know, parking was up there, but you know, I think the Belmont Market. A lot of people go there, apparently. Through the chair, surprisingly. Mark, um, yeah, yeah. Could, uh, Jeff, could we actually get um, some kind of summary or whatnot of the community outreach polling results? I'm sure we can get that for you from the Shape San Carlos. You know, we can get you a detail. Okay, thank uh, you for the council on that. All right, other questions. So. Jeff, can you tell us what, what's the next step here? Uh, next step, uh, the staff will prepare some um, options for the city council to consider in terms of um, authorizing uh, the permit and any conditions that the council would like to see attached to that. And we'll try to give you several options based on some of the comments and feedback that we got from the council tonight. Great. Okay. Thanks very much, Dave. Thank, Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, David. Okay, we'll move on to item six, public comment for items not on the agenda. I have one speaker card this evening, and it is from John Lilligren. Good evening. Mr. Mayor and honorable council members, my name is John Lilligren. I live on Calypso Lane, and those of us within 1,000 feet of North Crestview Park recently received a letter from Christine Boland and Catherine Curtis of the Army Corps of Engineers informing us of an environmental investigation that is to be performed in North Crestview Park from January 20th to March 18th. The purpose of the investigation is to locate and remove, if present, former underground fuel storage tanks utilized by the Department of Defense between 1942 and 1944. Uh, a separate letter from the Corps states that the city has until February 17th to communicate any concerns to the Corps regarding the final draft plan to search for and remove these storage tanks. However, the project timeline and schedule that is uh, in the library, uh, Christine Boland put that on file, it indicates that the Corps intends to begin site preparation and mobilization next Monday, February 1st. 
pre-excavation activities will be performed after the completion of site preparation activities. The pre-excavation activities include a backhoe with excavator bucket or similar heavy equipment that will be mobilized to the site on the first day of excavation, February 10th, according to their plan. A staging area for the heavy equipment, tools, and supplies will be established in the work area. Note that the heavy equipment is scheduled to be moved into North Crestview Park on February 10th, one week before the February 17th uh, deadline to communicate concerns. Therefore, um, the con contrary to the plan, the plan states that there are uh, no species of concern in the area, that they're more than a mile away. Uh, there is a California species of special concern nesting in North Crestview Park. That species is the San Francisco dusky wood rat, and my wife earlier today located 13 nests in North Crestview Park. So therefore, my neighbors and I contend that the city, the county, uh, the Corps of Engineers, and their contractor must comply with CEQA and the National Environmental Policy Act, respectively, before performing any additional site preparation or pre-excavation activities. In particular, we want to be sure that th this precludes mobilizing and staging heavy equipment in North Crest Crestview Park until CEQA and the Environmental Act are complied with to identify ways that environmental damage can be avoided or reduced. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Do I have any other, and is there anyone else wishing to speak on any items not on the agenda this evening? Hearing none, we'll move on to the consent calendar. Item seven, consent items are considered non-controversial and will be enacted in a single motion. Any member of the council or member of the public can request that an item be removed. Mr. Mayor, I move approval of the consent calendar. Second. I have a motion and a second. Yvette, please call the roll. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grisilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Not present. Councilmember Olbert? Yes. Mayor Johnson? Yes. We'll now move on to item 8A, consideration of introducing an ordinance amending chapter 10.16, speed limits of the municipal code, lowering the speed limits on Holly Street between Old County and Industrial Road to 25 miles an hour, and Old County Road between Hall Street and, Bel and the Belmont City limits to 30 miles an hour. Mr. Walter. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council, Jay Walter, Public Works Director. And tonight we have before you uh, an item to introduce an ordinance which will alter the speed limits on two of our streets, Old County Road and Holly Street, um, as a result of uh, changes uh, to those streets over the course of the last year. So as part of the, of the process to uh, set speed limits within the city, the vehicle code specifies that an engineering and traffic survey be conducted. And that engineering and traffic survey is done so that there can be a legally defensible means of um, establishing a speed limit and then performing traffic enforcement on that particular section of the roadway as well. The original surveys for Old County Road and Holly Street were completed in 2006. Technically, they're valid for 10 years. Um, so in addition to the fact that we had geometric changes along portions of Holly Street and Old County Road, we also were coming up on the anniversary date, so it uh, proved to be a convenient time for going ahead with the engineering and traffic survey. So on the screen before you are the portions of Old County Road and Holly Street that were the subject of the investigation and the surveys. The um, segments are labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And the segments tonight that are subject to the ordinance uh, and the amendment are sections one and section four. Section two, three, and five are ones which uh, do not change based on the speeds that were recorded and the data that was gathered. So we'll be focusing attention and ask for council's action on the sections one and four. So the engineering and traffic survey includes, and this is based on the California um, Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, which is the guiding principle for us for traffic control on public roadways in California. It requires that prevailing speeds have to be uh, uh, determined by traffic engineering measurements on the section of roadway. We have to evaluate collision records, and we have to look for highway or roadside conditions that are not readily apparent to the driver. So something that's very obvious to the driver um, 
uh, uh, say as an example, uh, large commercial development with a driveway is something that um, doesn't necessarily factor into a speed survey, but smaller residential driveways, other driveways that are, um, uh, say, back from the edge of the roadway, some of those may not be readily apparent. And so those are the things that we would be looking at as far as factors to consider. Also in the MUTCD, um, speed limits are required to be uh, established and posted at the nearest five mile per hour increment of the 85th percentile speed. The 85th percentile speed is the speed that at or which 85% of the motorists on a certain segment are traveling at a given point in time. That's determined um, uh, sort of by or sort of trial and error over the years as being a reasonable and prudent speed for the use of that roadway. So our cases, in our cases where you have a five mile an hour increment where your speed survey doesn't result in an exact speed at a five mile per hour increment, um, then there can be some rounding up or down of that speed limit uh, and, and then adjustments made based on other factors. We have the uh, requirement also that when we round down and or reduce recommend reducing speed limits uh, below the 85th percentile speed, we need to provide that documentation and justification in the engineering and traffic survey, and that has to be signed off by a registered civil and traffic civil or traffic engineer. City hired Hexagon trans uh, traffic consultants to do the engineering and traffic survey for us. Uh, we received that information. We discussed it with the consultant. We had a number of things that uh, we felt needed to be included in the survey and uh, the documentation for the speed limits to be set. And that was signed off by a registered civil and traffic engineer for Hexagon. And that's what we're basing our uh, recommendations to the council on tonight. So as an example, just to give the public a little bit better understanding of how this could work, when the measured 85th percentile speed is 32 miles per hour, you're allowed to round down to the nearest five mile per hour increment. That is, you can start your discussion about the speed limit that can be posted there by moving that speed down to 30 miles per hour. The speed limit can be further reduced by five miles per hour based on engineering judgment and other factors. On the other hand, if your 85th percentile speed of that same road segment was 34 miles per hour, then the first move needs to be to round that speed limit up to the nearest five mile per hour increment. But then you can reduce it by five miles per hour based on the engineering judgment and other factors. So if you use the 32.5 mile per hour speed, anything that comes in between 30 and 32.5, you round down first. Anything between 32.5 and 35, you round up first. And that's the way that you uh, apply the, the first sort of um, increment of speed uh, before you can begin to apply other factors. So in the examples uh, that I just mentioned, and when you look at the table that's on the screen right now, uh, when you look at segment one, you can see that the this uh, critical speed was 35.8, and so the first round would be down to 35, and then we used our judgment based on the factors that we saw to round the speed limit, to further reduce this potential speed limit to 30 miles per hour. Sections two and three remained the same as previously studied. Section four was one where we had a critical speed, an, or a critical speed, 85th percentile speed of 31.8, so we rounded down to 30 in the first, uh, the, with the first adjustment, and then we could f uh, further recommend to round, to go down to 25 miles per hour based on the factors that we saw. And then section five was one that had the same um, results as previously studied in 2006. So as far as traffic enforcement goes, per the vehicle code, speed limits are set based on an engineering and traffic survey and traffic enforcement is based on a legally defensible engineering and traffic survey. So in the case, in, in, in a situation where the sheriff's office would be out um, monitoring a roadway segment for uh, speeding, any moving violations that were issued based on a speed limit that, would be, that was set arbitrarily low would not be supported if challenged in court. So for example, if we just felt like 30 miles per hour was too fast and we decided that as a, as a city we wanted it to be 25 miles per hour, unless that was supported by that engineering and traffic survey and the law that has been established in California, 
we would not be able to um, have traffic enforcement at that speed. And so effectively, we would have established a speed trap. And that's not something that uh, I know our sheriff is, uh, 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 would be happy about. He definitely wants to be able to enforce speeds in a legal, legally defensible way. So again, segment one, Old County Road, from the Belmont city limit to Hall Street, which is south of the Caltrain station, the factors that we considered to reduce the speed were the fact that new bulb outs have been built and we have wider sidewalks. We also have an increased amount of bicycle and pedestrian activity based on the uh, north-south bike route that we established on Old County Road, as well as the proximity to the Caltrain station and the greatly um, increased amount of activity there. And we don't like to create short little speed zones and we like to have compatibility with adjacent jurisdictions. And so the Old County Road section in Belmont is 30 miles per hour. So with the speed reduction we're recommending on Old County Road, it matches up to the section in Belmont at 30 miles per hour. And in section four on Holly Street, again, the, the section we determined through there, of course the lanes are narrow with the four lanes available to the traveling public more hours of the day. We also, uh, uh, where the parking lane is converted to the travel lane, and so the traffic is traveling in much closer proximity to themselves as well as the edge of the roadway. We believe the residential density with the many, many driveways create factors which drivers may not be ready to see as a, um, a driver might be coming out of a driveway, could be very sudden and not much room to react. And we believe also from a, a bicycle and pedestrian safety standpoint, we have an increase in activity with both of those modes. We feel strongly that that's another good reason for us to, to um, uh, recommend a reduced speed in that section. So the recommendation for the council tonight is to introduce the ordinance that would amend chapter 10.16, speed limits of the municipal code. And the, uh, the essentially the engineering and traffic survey recommends that the speed limit on Holly Street between Old County Road and Industrial uh, be lowered to 25 miles per hour, and the speed limit on Old County Road between Hall Street and the Belmont City limits be reduced to 30 miles per hour. So at this point, I'd be happy to take questions from the council. Thank you, Jay. Questions for Jay? Mark? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Jay. Um, actually, uh, uh, only one of my questions is, is, for, is for Jay. Um, and, and that's, have we thought about, uh, I, I really like the summary you put together of how the rules work and the logic flows through here because this is a topic that comes up all the time in my correspondence with, with, uh, with residents. Um, have we thought about uh, synopsizing that with maybe some examples and putting it on the city website someplace so people could refer to it? In fact, we do have a, um, I'm not sure that it's as complete a primer, but we do have that on the website page that has the list of all the speed zones within the city. Great. I apologize for not knowing that, um, but maybe there's a way to highlight it in some fashion. Um, my next question actually is for the, the chief, if I may, which is um, in a situation like this, chief, where we are uh, changing and lowering speed limits, um, is it uh, typical that that there would be some uh, at least short-term heightened level of enforcement to kind of get the message out or do we let just nature take its course or what, what, what's how do we proceed with this it's typical that we would have some heightened level of enforcement short term and also that that would be a warning period right. and we would most likely warn motorists for a period of two to three or four weeks depending upon what we're seeing out there and um, and so and we would do it a focused enforcement initially Okay, great, thank you. And if, Mr. Mayor, if I may indulge myself a little bit more. I had one other question for Jay. Um, the, um, uh, we had at one point, I'm trying to remember, we talked about uh, uh, banning truck traffic on the, in the Holly Corridor. Has that already happened or is that in process or? That has already happened. That has already happened. And, and actually it's, a, it's interesting if you um, wanted to ask the chief that question. Uh, they've had, um, uh, I think, Quite they've been quite successful in uh, citing a number of trucks coming through the corridor okay. uh, for that purpose. Good, good. Glad, I mean, not, I'm sorry people are being cited, but hopefully they're learning from that that we don't want trucks in the corridor. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Ron? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just had uh, one question. Jay, you mentioned uh, that lowering the speed limit to 30 miles an hour to the Belmont line made a lot of sense because 
Belmont speed limit is 30 miles an hour. Um, well, on the south end where Old County Road becomes, I forget what they call it, Stafford, uh, it just road changes the name there. It's 30 miles an hour there. Um, is there, was there any thought or to, given to just keeping it 30 miles an hour all the way down to the Redwood City line or, or just based on that study that the average speed is just too, far, too high to, to lower it down to the 30 mile an hour limit? In fact, we did, um, we did consider that. And one of the factors as you get south of Hall Street, you begin to get, um, you, you begin to be in proximity to um, many very much larger commercial parcels that have fewer driveway accesses, fewer side streets, and as you cru as you continue on through Britain and down Howard, the um, uh, we, you don't have the residential character, and there aren't as many things which we felt would would influence a driver to want to drive more slowly. And the speed readings actually bore that out. So as they went down through that way, then you get into Redwood City, and you get immediately into a more residential area. So I, we believe that's why Res, Redwood City has the lower speed limit there, but we feel that the, this is the second survey in a row that has indicated a 35 mile an hour speed limit for that section on the south end of town to be appropriate. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you, Ron. Any other questions for Jay? Is there any public comment on this topic? Hearing none, I will, oh, yes, please come on up. You can fill out a speaker slip afterwards. Sorry, I wasn't planning to speak. I just was sitting here. Um, I feel like I'm supposed to speak just because I live on that street. And sure. as you all know, you probably recognize me by now. Would you mind um, introducing yourself? Um, my name's Holly, and I live on Holly Street, and I live right on a busy spot. So um, I just want to thank you for listening to Jay. And Jay, thank you so much for recommending it. It means a lot to me. I know this, this weekend I was out pulling some weeds in the front, and um, she wants to be out with me while I'm out there, and I keep saying, go, 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 you know, back toward the door, back in the gate, in the gate. So just lowering it just a little bit makes me feel a lot better, and I just feel really grateful, so thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you, Holly. Mr. Mayor? Uh, Mr. Mulpey? Yeah, if I may, I was asked by um, Council Member uh, Grocott on this item to simply pass along to the council and the community um, his uh, agreement with an email that uh, you all, I believe, received from a, a Susan Norris in terms of um, continuing to look at uh, the uh, lowering of speed limits in the area uh, around Old County, especially within the quarter mile or so of the Holly intersection uh, coming from Redwood City towards San Carlos, uh, given the residential character of the neighborhood. So I'm passing that on at his request. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mark. I move to introduce ordinance number 1500. Oh, I should get a prize for that one. 1500. <laughs> An ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Carlos amending Chapter 10.16, speed limits of the Municipal Code, lowering the speed limits on a Holly Street between Old County Road and Industrial Road to 25 miles per hour, and Old County Road between Hall Street and the Belmont City limits to 30 miles per hour. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Yvette, please call the roll. Council Member Collins? Yes. Council Member Grisilli? Yes. Council Member Grocott? Not present. Council Member Olbert? Yes. Mayor Johnson? Yes. Okay, moving on to item 8B, uh, adopting a resolution of support for the final plan recommended by the Four Corners Working Group for improvements along Alameda de las Pulgas in the vicinity of Carlmont High School and Tierra Linda Middle School. Mr. Walter. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council. Jay Walter, Public Works Director. <clears throat> Here tonight for this, the item on the, uh, kind of the final, uh, one of the final steps, at least in this part of the process, for the Four Corners Traffic Study that was undertaken uh, by the cities of San Carlos and Belmont and the Sequoia Union High School District and the San Carlos School District. Um, for uh, Members of the public who may not be completely aware, and for the council as a reminder, the uh, picture on the screen shows the, uh, the corridor that was studied. And as you can see kind of from the top left, it goes from the intersection of Alameda de las Polgas and Ralston Avenue, continues on down through Belmont back to the, uh, the point where Carlmont High School 
uh, is situated, as well as Tierra Linda Middle School. And then around the corner into the lower right portion of your screen where San Carlos Avenue disappears down towards uh, San Carlos. And the, um, essentially that's the, that's the limit of the study that was undertaken. And so the Four Corners Working Group was started with the, uh, the participation of two board members from each of the school district boards and two council members from each of the city councils. And the working group essentially got together on eight separate occasions to uh, listen to um, the uh, consultant that was hired to begin to evaluate existing conditions, to uh, start talking about what potential alternatives there were, and sort of and sorting through the various things that could be done to try to alleviate the concerns uh, that were, were found in this corridor. And the, in the process, there were school walking audits conducted on both campuses with our traffic consultant and, and uh, um, representatives from the school districts and two public workshops that were held. And uh, they, that's where we essentially took input and got feedback from the general public and uh, both well attended and uh, gave us some important information to put into the overall study. Of course, the, the problems of the corridor are um, known to many but essentially congested traffic flow, concerns about bicycle and pedestrian safety and circulation through the corridor, access from Cranfield Avenue, which is a particular concern for several of our, of our San Carlos residents, the lack of, of transit that is uh, uh, readily available through the corridor um, for the schools, um, the school access and bell times, which can be confusing and have been confusing at times as it relates to the, uh, the variable amount of congestion that's experienced. And really, the, the key thing that the Four Corners Working Group, I think, tackled and did very well was kind of put behind them a lack of a real coordinated effort to try to solve this problem and come up with a solution that could be endorsed by um, each of the agencies involved. And in fact, I believe the two school boards are, if they have not already, are considering adopting a resolution of support. And the city of Belmont, as I understand it, will be doing that at their first meeting in February. So um, again, all on the same page, trying to um, endorse a plan that we can move forward with. Several alternatives were studied, and there were a variety of things that were uh, uh, kind of tried out and, uh, and, and ultimately rejected. The first alternative had traffic signals as a predominant means of controlling the traffic at the entrance points. And, and that based on its analysis uh, by the consultant and the, the uh, discussions did not prove to be one that was the preferred. The second alternative um, used roundabouts. And the concept of these mini roundabouts is something that the consultant has been very clear on that uh, will be very beneficial to the corridor. And, and I think along the way, he was able to convince the, the various members of the working group that, um, that, that that logic was sound. This one in particular differs because it has a roundabout that also provides access to both schools. That was ultimately rejected as uh, uh, potentially being too, congestion, too much congestion in the very middle of that area. Um, and so we moved on to alternative three, which provides many roundabouts at the intersection of El Verano and Alameda, at Chula Vista and Alameda, and Cranfield and Alameda. And the interesting thing about this one is that at the Cranfield intersection, uh, we also are, um, have requi are requiring and have um, gotten uh, uh, support from Carlmont to eliminate the entry point, exit point, from their campus at that location, which really helps clean up that intersection and, and provide for much less congestion. The consultant ran level of service analysis for the preferred alternative and um, noted improvements in level of service at virtually all the intersections. The Alameda at Ralston intersection is not to be changed with the plan and that one has its own um, host of, of congestion problems uh, at where it's located and it, the function it serves. But the alternative three um, has shown to be uh, an improvement at a level of service within the corridor. So alternative three, uh, supported as the preferred alternative. Again, in the, um, in the big picture, if you look to the far left, there's a traffic signal that's proposed to be placed at Carlmont Drive in Alameda de los Polgas. That was sort of one of those things that was 
um, a foregone conclusion from the very beginning based on the analysis. We haven't publicized it much, but it is a plan, part of the plan, and I just wanted to make sure that it was, it was pointed out to you tonight. Another interesting discussion that took place in regards to the alternative three being the preferred was, as you can see on the screen, there's crosswalk locations that are at and near the roundabouts. There's a, uh, an asterisk there because the final location of those crosswalks and how they will be handled has yet to be determined because we had significant discussion about the idea of using paid crossing guards as a way to organize the pedestrian traffic at those locations. We believe strongly that that's been successful in San Carlos and we believe strongly that that should be a, a component in the final plan as it moves forward, but it yet hasn't been determined how that would be paid for. So that's something that's still open to negotiation and discussion. The other point in the middle of the screen where the two school entrances are shown, both campuses are undergoing some additional site planning and potential future construction. And so we have, we have shown sort of um, as a picture where the entrance points could be. But we know and we, have, uh, we certainly are allowing the schools to make the final determinations on how those entry points will connect. They're in support of those entrances being off of Alameda and being right turn in, right turn out only. Uh, but the final location, we believe, has to be left up to the school districts as they do their own site planning. So the intersection traffic control, as I had pointed out before, heavily relies on the uh, idea of mini roundabouts at these locations. The mini roundabout is designed to um, avoid the stop, stop, stop that a four-way stop sign has and with the, the addition of the crossing guards to help organize the pedestrian behavior, we believe we will get a better regular flow, although slower, during those peak congested times. <coughs> One of the key benefits of the roundabouts will be in the off-peak hours, when you will be able to circulate through this corridor fairly quickly without having to stop at all those intersections for no reason other than there was a stop sign there. And so we, we think that's a, a, a very big benefit for the off-peak time. As far as pedestrian facilities, new sidewalks will be built and sidewalks will be reconstructed through the corridor, very specifically along the Tierra Linda edge uh, of Alameda. <clears throat> the sidewalk will connect between Chula Vista and back up to the corner where you go around towards Dartmouth. We we'll believe that's a, a very important component, especially as TL adds an entrance point on that uh, part of Alameda. The crosswalks, as I mentioned before, important to organize them and not have them be at multiple locations or to allow for multiple uh, points of, of crossing. One of the, the components of alternative three is a low height median fence that's being installed from Cranfield all the way down to Chula Vista that will not allow pedestrians to simply cross anywhere they want on Alameda. It will channelize the pedestrians from, uh, at, to cross at the points we want them to cross at. As far as bicycle facilities, bike lanes will be maintained and established throughout the corridor <clears throat> where they encounter the mini roundabouts. Traffic speeds are slow enough to where we believe the, the bicyclists can either get off and use the pedestrian access around the mini roundabouts or they can actually go in with the cars and negotiate the roundabouts at very slow speeds. It should not be an, uh, a, uh, a safety concern at all. And both of the schools have indicated a willingness to provide um, bike access and parking on the campuses to help facilitate that. The on-street parking, as the council's aware, there's diagonal parking on Alameda de los Polgas in front of Carlmont right now. <clears throat> that parking is being reorganized as the roadway will be, will be widened to accommodate the, uh, the additional sidewalks and there'll be parallel parking on both sides of the street. That parking can be used for staff parking, student parking as it currently is as well as drop-off zones that um, could be established for both schools along that frontage. And the, throughout the discussion, there was the, um, the regular uh, sort of introduction of the idea that the schools are expanding <clears throat> and there will be more students. And as a result, certainly at Carlmont, there will be more cars and the need for more parking. And again, that's something that as from a campus planning standpoint, um, cities don't have much ability to regulate but yet we know that, the, uh, that, that trying to handle that off-street parking demand is going to be a big issue. We don't know yet where that will go, but we've identified that there will be more parking needed. And exactly where it can be accommodated um, is another question uh, that the study didn't cover. 
We did work with transit, kind of brought them in late, but we believe that we've got identified an ability for Sam Trans to be able to have good transit access to both Tierra Linda and Carlmont, and we hope that that also helps to um, kind of pave the way for um, establishing more and more, uh, say, more frequent and regular bus service that will help alleviate some of the traffic congestion if our parents can be, uh, would be willing to put their kids on the bus to be transported there. Kind of like the old days. I remember being on the bus when I was a kid. So, School access points, again, new access points along Alameda de los Pulgas for both schools. We are going to be maintaining the existing access out of Tierra Linda Middle School that comes out through Dartmouth because we believe that a loop entry and exit is a, a very good feature for circulation. And the one, uh, I think, a very significant uh, item is the closing of that Carmont access point on the south corner of campus, which will uh, really help clean up the issues at Cranfield Avenue. Cost estimates, this is not going to be a cheap project. As you can see, there are a number of components, and we've given our best, consultants given his best information to estimate costs. <clears throat> and these are costs which we believe will be shared by the cities, by the schools, um, and uh, certainly we're going to be looking for grant opportunities to help we believe and we've maintained since this process started that the four agencies working together with a joint application for um, what used to be the old safe route to school program in the active transportation program will yield a much better result in terms of grant uh, favorability and, um, uh, and the idea that we would be accomplishing so much over each of the four jurisdictions. As far as phasing, I don't really want to go into a lot of the detail here, but the consultant did spend some time helping us figure out whether pieces of the project could be built at different times. Um, and so we'll be working again um, as campus development occurs and as the opportunity comes up for grants to try to right size uh, these and, and be able to be competitive for funding. So next steps, we see this now as we've come kind of the, to the conclusion of the working group, at least so far that uh, we'll be uh, getting endorsement from each, each of the agencies on the, the preferred alternative. The school site planning will continue and get underway with various improvements that will occur. We'll be looking for funding uh, through various grant agencies. We'll need to uh, begin the design and environmental process, which means we'll have to probably come up with some seed money to hire consultants to do that. Uh, and then we'd be looking to do construction and probably optimistically um, if it all can't be done at once, it's probably going to be a three to five year venture to get all this done once everybody's ducks line up and construction uh, can begin to occur. So at this point, I'd be able to uh, take questions for the council, but it's our hope that you will um, adopt the resolution that will endorse the um, Four Corners Working Group preferred plan. Thank you, Jay. Um, questions for Jay? Mark? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Jay. Um, and thank you, too, to... Uh, um, uh, Bob and, and Ron uh, for working on the working group. Uh, I know I, Ron and I were on there initially uh, uh, years ago. I'm glad to see you guys stuck to it, and I'm glad that everybody was able to come up with a, with a uh, coherent plan. Um, I have basically two questions, Jay. Uh, the first one has to do, I guess, with the phasing concept you were talking about, but from a slightly different tact. Um, and this next comment, I don't mean a criticism of any other of our fellow agencies, but coordinating the budgetary resources of four agencies, unless we're successful in getting one grant that we jointly apply for to cover everything, can be uh, difficult. Um, and I just want to make sure that as the plan unfolds, that we don't, has thought been given to making sure that we don't end up building the first two parts anticipating that the third and fourth parts are going to get built, and then the third and fourth parts never get built because that agency says, I'm sorry, I don't have the money, I've got other priorities, budget crisis, what have you. And then we end up with a situation worse than we have now in, in some fashion. So has that dimension of the phasing of things been considered that we don't get into situations that would arguably be worse than what we already have? That was part of the discussion on the phasing, uh, the options for phasing. And it was anticipated that that may very well come true. That is, uh, we could hit another economic slowdown and the schools could decide that their campus expansion plans are on hold and there's not going to be anything happening. Um, or, as we would get into it, there would be more important priorities for the, the cities to be involved with and to be spending money on. Um, so we believe, we hope that we will have 
um, smaller chunks that can be built, that can be beneficial. Um, quite honestly, I think the, um, uh, the, uh, the introduction of these mini roundabouts, even if it was one at a time, would be beneficial. It's not that you would gain the whole corridor's improvement in circulation, but you would certainly gain an improvement at that particular location. So I believe that, that we can phase it right, um, but we'll keep our fingers crossed that the funding won't be all gone so that we won't have any opportunity to move it all. Well, I appreciate the answer because that relieves a lot of my concern, and I just would ask staff to make sure they stay on top of that, that, that uh, you know, because, because a multi-piece puzzle doesn't always go together. You just got to make sure that you don't end up building something that's, that's worse. I should also say, by the way, I forgot to mention before, I think we should all thank Senator Hill for having convened this, uh, this working group in the first place. I believe it was at the request of one of our, our residents, Cecily Harris, who lives on Cranfield, so probably thank her as well. Um, your comment about the mini roundabouts being done by one, one by one J is still giving benefits uh, brings me to my second question. Um, um, first, just a gentle reminder, you and I still have a date that we have to fulfill going out looking at some roundabouts in operation. Um, I have to tell you that the longer I've lived with the roundabout at the intersection of Chestnut and Magnolia, which I go through all the time, and the more time I spend going through the Holly-El Camino interchange, which isn't a roundabout, but it has elements of the roundabout with the right hand, the heavy flow of traffic on the right hand turn going underneath, you know, um, I still have some significant doubts about how safe in, in, let's call it, relatively dense but still rapidly moving traffic a roundabout is. I understand that if there's very little traffic, it's not an issue, and that if there's an awful lot of traffic, it's all moving so slowly, it doesn't matter. But I see, frankly, a lot of near misses in, in those situations. Um, and, and what happens is that there's, there's probably even in the law some rule that says uh, a car has a right of way when it's actually in the roundabout. So you're not supposed. But you know, human beings being what they are, it's kind of well, that guy's not quite there yet. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna accelerate a little bit more and get in there, and that sets the stage for these these near miss things that I keep seeing. So I am still kind of concerned about that, and I appreciate whatever comments you could make to uh, alleviate some of those concerns. Well. Uh, in speaking in particular about the one that's at Chestnut and Magnolia, um, that was not that was not designed as a roundabout. That was really just a neighborhood traffic circle, which it really effectively favors Magnolia traffic versus Chestnut traffic. And so the 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 common behavior as folks have been using it has simply been Magnolia has the right of way and Chestnut waits. And Which so, is, in fact, how it's marked, because it's yield, it's yield on chestnut. Right. But now, recently, we have remarked that intersection with a yield on each of the four entry points in order to try to help train motorists and residents that, hey, you know what, when you approach one of those, you yield on entry. Now, it may take a little bit of time to sort of break out of the old patterns. That's the way that that one had been used for many, many years. But the geometric design of the mini roundabout is, is, is essentially set up to have a um, less of a, of a of give, to give the motorist less of an idea that he can kind of just slalom his way through and stay on the straight path that he wanted to go on. But he actually has to slow, come to a point where he has to make a sharper turn to go around the roundabout and then out the other side. So that the, if I hear what you're saying, the geometry of the mini roundabout is such that the turning is sharper than it is on, as you call it, a neighborhood traffic circle. That's right. Which, which in, okay, and I, that, I, I can accept that, that no driver in their right mind is going to try and whip through a roundabout that they have to turn hard through. At least most drivers are not going to. Right. And it's um, so, so it all becomes about the design and then the implementation of it. Actually, it's physically in place after it's physically in place. I still do have a little bit of concern. As I said, the Holly El Camino situation is not a roundabout at all. But you have elements of that a little bit with the two lanes of traffic that turn right and make a fairly sharp right-hand turn to get onto um, eastbound Holly. Um, and, and when the lights turn, I mean, that traffic continues to flow for quite a while, even when traffic from Holly is trying to go through there. Through the chair, uh, much as I'm interested in this, uh, could this be done <laughs> offline? <laughs> Well, I mean, Bob, I'm trying to ask questions to... I didn't hear the question. I apologize. Well, my question was I have concerns about whether the roundabouts are a safe and rational that, thing to I do. Thought he, I thought he answered it. I'm sorry. Okay. 
um, appreciate your flexibility. I don't always comment when I think other people are asking questions that make no sense to me either. Um, uh, you know what, Jay, in the interest of uh, the diocese's concerns, I will talk to you about this later since there doesn't seem to be any interest in talking about it here. All right. Thank you, Mark. Ron. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, just to, uh, one uh, comment and then one question. And the first one is just thank you, uh, Afshin, uh, your, your counterpart in Belmont, um, Yvette, for coordinating all the meetings. Uh, it's, it's, been a long, it's been a long slug. Uh, but I think it's finally borne some fruit. Uh, my only question, though, is um, given the relatively low cost, I think we all thought this thing was going to be 5 to $10 million. Um, I think it's a relatively low cost, considering you know, all the changes we're projecting making. Um, do you think that that helps our position in, in getting funding? Because this is a project that affects two cities, a couple of schools, um, it, it, a very heavily congested traffic area. Is, are those all points that would help us in going to uh, the funding and the fact that a relatively small amount of money could uh, really solve a, a, a you know, big traffic problem in the morning? I or, think so. And the other aspect of that is that uh, the grant amount would be lower, which would mean a correspondingly lower local match that each of the agencies would have to come up with as well. So, you know, typically you're going to have to be required to match 20 to 25 percent of whatever grant you get. So if your total amount's lower, then your matching amount's going to be lower too, which is going to have less of an impact on each of the individual budgets. Would the 25 percent be split up between the four or is it 25 per? Will we take the total, will we take the total cost and say that 25 percent of what is it? Two and a half million is what? Eight, Say roughly eight hundred thousand. Um, the twenty-five percent. Yeah. So, so you'd be. We we still have yet to look at how sorry, does this split? 000. How does this split out between all the agencies as far as a, a cost share? So it's not going to be evenly split. It's not. But it's. But just talking in those terms, the match is going to be. We're going to need to have some commitment of match from each of the agencies to move forward with a with a combined grant application. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you, Ron. Any other questions for Jay? Is there any public comment on this uh, topic? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. All right, Mr. Mayor, I will uh, move that we adopt uh, resolution 2016-12, a resolution of the City Council and the City of San Carlos supporting the final plan recommended by the Four Corners Working Group for improvements along Alameda, Alameda de las Pogas in the vicinity of Carlman High School and Tyrrell in the Middle School. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Uh, well, I will just echo the comments made earlier. I want to commend uh, all my colleagues for serving on the um, uh, Four Corners Working Group. This is arguably the most congested um, intersection in the city of San Carlos and bringing four different agencies together to solve a, a traffic problem sounds like a very daunting um, enterprise, but uh, it's actually gone quite well and I appreciate um, all the effort that's been done and I'm excited to see uh, this project get completed. Um, and with that, I'll ask Yvette to call the roll. Council Member Collins? Yes. Council Member Grisilli? Yes. Council Member Grocott? Apps not present. Council Member Olbert? Yes. Mayor Johnson? Yes. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm going to ask that we take um, item 8D out of order, seeing that we have a number of um, presenters here from uh, San Mateo County. So we'll move, unless there's an objection, um, hearing none, we'll move forward with 8D, consideration of adopting a resolution to join the joint exercise of powers agreement to establish the Peninsula Clean Energy Authority in San Mateo County and appointing the director and alternate to the JPA board, Ms. Peterson. Good evening, Council. My name is Tara Peterson, the Assistant City Manager. And before you this evening is a couple of actions concerning community choice energy. I just wanted to mention before we get going, you've already acknowledged that there are uh, folks here from both the Office of Sustainability, Supervisor Pine's office, and of course, Supervisor Groom is here. And with that, we'll get started. Where is he? There we go. Uh, we have discussed this at council uh, at several meetings, but I thought I'd just give really quick overview of what community choice energy is. 
And what is proposed this evening is Peninsula Clean Energy would, uh, the city would join in with this group uh, of other city uh, agencies within San Mateo County as well as the county itself. Uh, the PCE would purchase electri electricity from renewable energy sources, and then the utility company, in our case PG&E, would deliver the energy, maintain the lines, and build the customers. And the customers would benefit from affordable rates, local control, and clean energy. This is a quick overview of the timeline. Phase one is complete. We are in phase two and nearing the end of that. Phase two includes uh, passing resolutions uh, to join the AJPA and to uh, <clears throat> adopt an ordinance and then of course uh, introduce and adopt an ordinance to join in with uh, or uh, offer community choice aggregation in San Carlos. And then phase three would be March to October where the JPA really gets going uh, and marketing takes place and then all of the other activities would take place to get this moving forward. Uh, a couple of the actions that city council has already taken on February 9th of last year, council agreed to provide data to the county for the technical study. On September 14th, the presentation was made uh, just on the formation of CCE. And then on November 9th, the technical study uh, results were presented to council. Uh, just a quick little scenario uh, or look at the scenarios that were looked at in the technical study. This is year one of a CCE program. Uh, scenario one, two, and three. Uh, scenario one has less renewable energy, 35%. Scenario two has 50%. And scenario three has 100% renewable. Uh, the next item, next column shows the costs. The cost of the 35% would be 6% savings. The cost for scenario two, which is the 50% renewable, would be a 4% savings. And the 100% renewable is actually an increase of 2%. I just would think it's important to note that scenario one, the 35% renewable, would not meet our GHG reduction goals that are in our climate action plan. Okay, there we go. Uh, recent developments since the technical study, the CPUC approved a 94% increase to PG&E's exit fee uh, for all CCE customers from $6.70 a month to $13 a month. The county's technical study assumed that this amount would be a 75% increase, so it's slightly higher than anticipated. Energy prices are currently lower than those assumed in the technical study. And as a result, net customer savings are still obtainable under a CCA program as proposed. Uh, finally, a point that we thought we should indicate this evening is that customers would automatically be opted in to Peninsula Clean Energy, but would also have the option to opt out and select PG&E as its utility at any time. Uh, action items for consideration this evening are to adopt a resolution to join with Peninsula Clean Energy, the Joint Powers Authority as established by the county, appointment of the director and alternate. alternate. Uh, this was done at the last council meeting, but this is the formal action. And finally, to introduce a ordinance to authorize implementation of a community choice aggregation program within the city. Uh, just a couple of points about the Joint Powers Agreement. It's governed by a board of directors made up of elected officials from jurisdictions that PCA serves. The JPA would be legally and financially separate from the city. There's no cost to join during the program launch. There may be a small fee later, but that has not been determined. Member agencies may withdraw with no financial obligation if the program cannot meet pricing and environmental goals at the time of the program launch. For more information, uh, you can visit the website at PeninsulaKeenEnergy.com or contact the Office of Sustainability at sustainability at San Mateo County 
gov.org. And if you have any questions, I'm here, as well as the city attorney who's reviewed the JPA document in, in detail, as well as uh, members of the supervisor's office, as well as the Office of Sustainability. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tara. Questions for Tara? Mark? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Tara. Good presentation. Um, could you uh, uh, put back up, uh, I think it was one slide ago, the Joint Powers Authority Agreement slide? That's it. Thank you. The very last bullet point, members may withdraw, et cetera. Um, first off, I just want to make sure I understand. When you say members may withdraw, you're talking about the city. Yes. N not the individual Member homeowners. agencies may withdraw. Member agencies. <laughs> Got it. Um, and am I to take it from that, the way that bullet point is written, that the ability to withdraw is contingent only, uh, contingent upon the pricing and environmental goals not being met? that if they are met, there is no right to, to step out. Not that I want to, I just want to understand that. Address that. Good evening. Uh, my name is David Silberman. I'm a Chief Deputy County uh, Counsel for the County, and of course I defer to your city attorney who um, has also commented on this. There's actually three separate grounds uh, by which you can, with three separate ways that you can withdraw. One is this, which we're, we're calling the safety valve, um, which basically allows you to get out uh, no conditions immediately if the JPA can't meet its goals. But there are actually two other times that you can withdraw. One, you can withdraw immediately if the JPA board uh, votes to uh, change the JPA agreement in a way that you, the city, doesn't like. That gives you another immediate um, withdrawal. And then in addition, uh, you can also withdraw for no reason. Now, the, the latter two uh, withdrawals potentially could have a cost, and I'd be happy to address that. Um, if you'd like, um, but it's, you know, it's uncertain. It really depends on how the city were to withdraw, whether it was willing to stage its withdraw, withdrawal, what the prices of, of energy were at that time. So it's basically based on whether there's cost to the JPA uh, accord, uh, affected by the withdrawal. Actually, uh, David, I think that's, a, that's perfectly fine in terms of understanding the details. One, one little follow-up. I, I presume that, and again, I'm not anticipating this happening, but if a member agency were to withdraw, then its residents who were previously part of the program, what their relationship with the program is severed and they revert back to PG&E. Correct. Okay. Correct. And there's another, uh, this is not terribly significant, but the city is also a customer. So the city can actually also, just like any other customer, can withdraw at any time from purchasing power from uh, the JPA if it wants to without withdrawing its customers. These withdrawal scenarios that I'm talking about are exactly what you alluded to, which is where the city both removes itself and its residents from the program. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Mark. Ron? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't know who can, maybe Tara can. Um, on the recent developments, bullet, first bullet point, it said uh, CPOC approved a 94% increase to PG&E exit fee for customers from 670 a month to 13. That's $13 a month for how long? I mean, do, they, do they have to just pay it every month that they don't want to be in it? As long as they're opting out of... Just or an ongoing opting fee. into the PCE and not using uh, PG&E, then yes, they would pay it every month. Can we okay. Sure, you can stand up. <laughs> yeah. Help me out here. <laughs> sure. So um, this departing load charge, you know, is to compensate PG&E for having procured electricity on behalf of customers before <clears throat> they departed. I'm sorry, say that again. So the. Um, by the way, my name is Seth Baruch. I'm a, a consultant for the county. I should have said that. Um, so the, uh, the exit fee, what we call the power charge and difference adjustment, is a fee that uh, community choice customers and only community choice customers pay uh, to compensate uh, PG&E for having gone out and procured electricity on behalf of customers, say, in San Carlos, years prior. And they sign, you know, PG&E signs these long-term contracts. And then if that load departs, and joins the CCE program, uh, PG&E is entitled to get compensation for that because they will then have to sell that energy that was going to go to uh, a CCE customer back into the wholesale market. And wholesale market prices now are very, very low. So that's one of the key reasons why that PCIA jumped up so much. Now, if the market turns around and prices go up, uh, then the PCIA, which is adjusted every single year, so that 
$13 a month. Um, that is just for this year. It will change next year. It may go down, it may go up, but it, it changes from year to year. Eventually, once these contracts expire, the PCIA should go down and ratchet down over time. Maybe not to zero, but not to $13 a month. But it's, it's a monthly charge, and, um, uh, but it changes and should, over time, decrease. It's, it's reviewable every year. It's reviewable every year. In fact, actually, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of hoopla actually about this very issue because of the sudden spike. And the the PUC has been hearing a lot of um, uh, opinions about this issue, and they're holding a workshop actually uh, in March to talk about the methodology to calculate the PCIA. And it's possible there'll be some reforms that could uh, be of benefit to a CC program. There's uh, another county. Was it Marin County that's done this? Marin County and Sonoma County have both launched CC have programs. Have you experienced any of these uh, the fluctuating fees, or have, have people backed out? Uh, um, the opt-out rates have, have been pretty steady, actually. There hasn't been much change in the opt-out rates, even though the, the, the rates do um, vary over time. For all of Sonoma's history, and Sonoma's been around only since 2014, uh, the rates have been quite a bit lower than PG&E. Uh, Marin has generally been lower, not all the time. Uh, now it's, I think with this PCIA, it's about parity or maybe even slightly higher. However, we're not seeing any really dramatic change in opt-out rates. And what, what percentage of the overall customers is, does the opt-out opt -out number represent? Uh, in Sonoma, it's about 10%. About 10 percent of customers elect to go back to PG&E. And Marin, um, and Marin's kind of sort of an interesting history because they um, they had a, faced a lot of opposition from PG&E. So there's a lot of marketing against the program when it first launched. Uh, so that was over 20, 23 percent. Other communities have subsequently joined Marin as it's expanded, and its opt-out rates have been closer to Sonoma's. Okay. So it's declining. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Thank you, Ron. Other questions? I have one public speaker card from Jack Vanderen. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak under public comment? Uh, if not, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I'll move we adopt resolution 2016-13. A resolution of the City Council and the City of San Carlos authorizing and the, directing the Mayor to execute a joint exercise of powers agreement which will establish the Peninsula Clean Energy Authority with the City as a charter member and appointing Cameron Johnson to the City's, uh, to be the City's director on the board and Ron Collins to be the City's alternate director. I second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Mark. Uh, ju just a brief comment. Um, I wasn't sure which one to do this on D or the next one I'm going to do, but I'll do it here. Um, uh, I'm going to vote for this uh, uh, on a personal level. This is something I've been looking into as I've been hearing more about it. It looks very interesting for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, and I definitely want to encourage my fellow residents to uh, uh, be considering in enrolling in the program as well. Uh, however, I do want to also say that personally, I rather wish that the legislature had designed this as an opt-in system instead of an opt-out system. Um, it, it's, uh, it just feels a little odd to me to uh, kind of be dragging people into something, even if it's something I think it, they ought to be doing, uh, on basically what amounts to a utility bill. Um, you know, if, if we're going to if we're going to drag people into stuff, we have laws for that and regulations for that, and I have no problem with seeing those adopted. But to make it a matter of choice, but it's a choice where you have to opt out, just feels a little odd. But again, uh, I'm going to vote for this. Uh, we have nothing to do with how the legislature chose to implement it, uh, but maybe they'll listen to this kind of commentary going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Anyone else? Um, well, I'd like to say a few things, um, having been the representative of the city on the steering committee. You know, I think the reason that we're all here, why we're working on this, why the city's considering it, why the county has led this effort is that, you know, there's undeniable belief that man-made climate change is having a significant impact um, on our world and poses um, significant risk. And Unlike a lot of issues, climate change is one that needs government leadership. It's not going to be an issue where um, 
you know, voluntary activities by individuals or charities is going to get the job done. It, it needs government leadership. And, you know, thankfully we're seeing leadership at a lot of levels. I was very happy to see the recent um, Paris climate ta uh, talks go very well. We've seen a, a tremendous amount of leadership at the state level from um, Governor Brown, and I'm very happy to see the county now taking a leadership role, and, and we in San Carlos have an opportunity to do so as well. Um, this has been a, a really excellent process, and I want to commend um, Supervisor Groom and Supervisor Pine for leading it. It's been uh, a very inclusive, very open process, um, a very technically rigorous process. I've learned more about electricity policy than I will ever need to know. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately what this comes down to is that this program um, presents the opportunity uh, to do a lot of great things simultaneously. The first and foremost is that it will immediately increase um, the percentage of electricity that everyone in San Carlos is getting that comes from renewable sources. It provides customers a choice where they didn't have one in the past. You know, every time you sign up for a cell phone plan or Comcast, you know, you've got tiers, there's the platinum plan and the, you know, the entry plan. And, and when it comes to electricity, customers have no choice today in the market and this gives them an opportunity. And then finally, it creates an opportunity to invest capital in local renewable projects um, right here in San Carlos and in the county. And I think um, that's something that we can all support. So. Um, I'm very appreciative of all the work that's been done, and uh, I'm very excited um, to be supporting this tonight. And with that, I will ask Yvette to call the roll. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grisilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott, not present. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Johnson? Yes. And I believe you have a second motion. That the we Chair, yes. I'd like to move to introduce ordinance number. 1501. 1501, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Carlos authorizing the implementation of a community choice aggregation program. Second. I have a motion and a second. I assume there's no discussion. Yvette, call the roll. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grisilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Not present. Councilmember Olbert? Yes. Mayor Johnson? Yes. All right. Thank you for being here. May I just say thank you on behalf of Supervisor Pine and, and myself and the entire county. We now have uh, nine cities that have read the ordinance once or twice, and uh, we're very excited and we're ready to roll. Thank you. Okay, we will now take up um, item 8C. Adopting a resolution in support of restoring public bus routes within the city of San Carlos. Tara. Good evening, Council. Tara Peterson, Assistant to the City Manager. I'm happy to pass this off to our brand new Kristen Flores, who um, is the uh, Senior Management Analyst in the City Manager's Office. Welcome and congratulations. Thank you. Yes, it was Kristen Elderson until two days ago. Now it's Kristen Flores. <laughs> I was wondering about yes. that. Congratulations on that, too. <laughs> yeah. All right, so good evening, uh, Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Kristen Flores, and I'm the Senior Management Analyst in the City Manager's Office. And I'm here this evening for Council's consideration of a resolution in support of restoring public bus routes within the City of San Carlos. So as Council is aware, the City of San Carlos has experienced excessive traffic congestion around schools, um, particularly around drop-off and pick-up times when parents are transporting their kids to school or when the high schoolers are driving their individual vehicles to school. The heavy congestion has resulted in traffic and safety concerns for many of the residents and community members. The San Carlos Council of PTAs, the Four Corners Working Group, the San Carlos School District, and the City of San Carlos have all been working to find solutions to the traffic and safety concerns that the community is experiencing. And this actually falls right in line with Jay's presentation earlier on the Four Corners Working Group. Um, so as Jay had mentioned, one of the 
issues that had been identified was the access to transit that's available for students getting to and from school. And so one solution that's risen to the forefront is restoring bus services in San Carlos. Um, if SamTrans is able to restore bus routes within the city, this additional public transportation will provide an alternative for students to get to and from school and relieve a portion of the traffic congestion that the city is currently experiencing. In an effort to implement this solution, the San Carlos Council of PTAs, the school district, and the city have been working directly with SamTrans to restore bus services, and the groups have begun to make progress. Um, SamTrans has asked that the city and the school district provide formal support that restoring bus services is viable and will be supported by residents here in town. The San Carlos School District passed a similar resolution on January 14th of this year. So the recommendation for this evening is for council to adopt a resolution in support of SamTrans restoring bus routes within the city of San Carlos. And that concludes my brief presentation. So I would be happy to take any questions that the council might have. Thank you, Kristen. Bob? Um, has Sam Chan's indicated any way, shape, or form with what they're going to do after they get the formal responses? You know, I am not sure if they've given particulars. I think they're in the works to figure out exactly which route would be restored and the timing for that. And they didn't give you any time frame or anything? So, um, Tara, maybe you can fill in. Or There was a meeting on Friday with Sam Trent's staff that Tara and I both attended, and you can maybe give a brief summary. Sure. So um, the result of that meeting was there's a lot of internal challenges that Sam Trans is uh, burdened with. And while some of their staff seem very supportive of this idea of um, revamping, say, the old 46B bus line to serve the uh, Carlmont and TL area, the Four Corners area, uh, there's no commitment yet. Uh, one of the things they indicate that they would do is look at the grant program that's available to see if they could apply for grant funding to try to alleviate that problem, the problem of funding uh, this bus line. But um, they were noncommittal as to a date or a timeline, just that they would look into it. And, and I might just briefly elaborate to say um, the proposal, uh, nobody at the Sam Trans staff is saying the proposal is, is bad. It's just a question of timing and resources. And there is a, a agreement from Sam, Sam Trans staff that um, San Carlos is underserved from perspective of um, public transportation and that. Um, the current flex service, which is the main one of two main um, bus lines, is it has not been successful, and that they're moving forward with um, sunsetting that line, and that um, the alternative line that's been suggested that goes up in the hills um, is a has been viewed as a positive idea. It's a question of process, logistics, drivers, etc. So, uh, other questions for Tara? Uh, if not, any public comment on this issue? No Mr. Mayor, comment. I would yes, move sir. to adopt Resolution 2016-14, a resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos in support of restoring public bus routes within the City of San Carlos. Second. Second. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if I may, Mr. Mayor, I, I think it's also worth pointing out, I, I know we don't have anybody from the public here right now, but anybody who's listening to us, um, there is a way to also show informal support. If you go to sancarlospta.org, the website, you will see that there is a petition there that you will find several hundred of your friends and neighbors have already signed asking Sam Trans to look into this seriously and, and re-implement the bus route. And I would encourage everybody to go there and read the facts and sign the petition. Excellent point. I have a motion, and I have two seconds. Um, any discussion? Um, yeah, just just a general comment. I talked to Charles Stone, council member in Belmont today. He's very supportive of this because Belmont has its own bus uh, challenges, and uh, you know what what's good for us is potentially good for them as well. So he's very interested in the outcome of this, and uh, hopefully we uh, we pass it. There you go. Help from our friends in Belmont. Okay, Yvette. 
Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grisilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott, not present. Councilmember Olbert? Yes. Mayor Johnson? Yes. And with that, we are adjourned. Uh, Mr. Oh. Yes, sir. I, I just before you formally adjourn, I was yes. I was just going to ask you a question. Uh, would it be appropriate to close the meeting in recognition of Yvette for her services? I think that's an excellent idea. So to join me in giving Yvette a round of applause yes. for great work. Thank you. Good luck. You will be missed. Thank you for your service. Thank you. And with that, the meeting is adjourned.